limit time, um, recognizing that there are a number of you. We want to hear from all of you. And I will uh, just call you in, in the um, in the list that you've, the, in the order that you uh, signed up. So our first speaker is Derek DeMello. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Derek DeMello. I'm a first year history PhD student over on the Orono campus. And I'm gonna be speaking today about two things that are very personal to me. The first is the UMaine Graduate Workers Union. And then within that context, on the issue of housing, specifically the University Park family housing of which I am a resident. Um, the UMaine Graduate Workers Union is something that I'm proud to be a part of. I am a graduate student. I am a graduate worker. And being a graduate student, being a, being a graduate worker is what allows me to live and work at the University of Maine. Not very easily. Um, there are a lot of issues on the campus. There have been a lot of negotiations as of late, I'm sure everyone has heard. And the negotiations have, have been going very slow. And the Board of Trustees is in a great position to help us, to help people like me, I just moved up from southeastern Massachusetts. I landed at University Park. Without that and without my job, I would not be able to go to the University of Maine. And that's just a simple fact. I would not be able to work up here. I would not be able to live up here. So housing is something that is very important to me personally. Housing is something that is very important to all of our graduate workers in the union. It's something that is important for all students, for everyone that lives in not just the University of Maine, but for the greater Orono, Bangor area, the housing market is difficult. Everyone knows this. It is a very tough time to find a place to live. It is a very tough time to find an affordable place to live. And that's really where all of this comes together. Um, these bargaining goals that the union is pushing for have real consequences. These are not things as I'm sure you all know, that it just happened in a vacuum. These are things that, you know, there are people behind them. There are people like myself and like the other graduate workers who this is a real personal issue for. Now, to talk about University Park, for those um, that are not aware of University Park, um, even a lot of the students on campus are not, it is a family housing complex. It is very popular. It is inhabited mostly by graduate students, PhD students, and a lot, a lot, the majority of people living there are international students. It contains 18 buildings. It contains 72 units, both single and, and double bedroom apartments. There are a lot of children there. The capacity of University Park is over 250 people. Can you please wrap it up so that we can keep it Certainly. for a minute? Um, so just a quick, few quick points on University Park. Housing is the most basic and most important issue for graduate workers for everyone. 1961, when University Park opened, the president at the time had this to say. If I could just read this quote real quick. The general public and the scramble for the, a place to live is what these students and families were competing with. In providing University Park at cost to married students, the university simply chooses to render a service in order that more students may complete their education. University is important as an institution where it is. It is affordable. It is close to campus for international students without licenses in particular. It's not just family housing. It is family housing where it is at that cost, at that location. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and, and again, please limit your, your comments to three minutes. We have a particularly tight agenda, but we do want to hear from you. And uh, Benjamin Cain is next. Hello, uh, my name is Benjamin Cain. I'm also here to speak on behalf of the University of Maine Graduate Workers Union. Um, 
I wanted to sort of like echo a few things that Derek had said, and then also um, just emphasize a couple of points. Um, graduate workers are pushing extremely hard to get a fair first contract. Um, the University of Maine system has certain obligations that it has not been meeting. We've been pushing for fair and expeditious bargaining. The university has not responded to a request for information that we have, um, that we put in back in November to the extent that we have filed a prohibited practice charge with the Maine Labor Relations Board. I think it's emblematic of how slow the process is going that it's gotten to this point when it really should be moving more quickly. Um, we would ask that the Board of Trustees do what you can to push the University of Maine bargaining team and like whatever structures you guys have on, on your side to make sure that we get to a fair and expeditious contract as quickly as possible. As Derek mentioned, like these are human issues and every day that goes by without a contract is a day that graduate workers are dealing with real systemic problems where the only solutions are systemic solutions. Um, and I think that the other, th the other piece about bargaining that we would urge the board of trustees to take action on is we've been pushing very hard for the university system team to engage with every single one of our proposals. Uh, a big one has been international graduate worker rights. Graduate workers who are here on visas come in with a series of, of worker conditions that are very different from you know, domestic workers because they are restricted in who they can work for, what the conditions and terms and conditions are set by the visas. We, we believe that they deserve rights and that they are not second-class citizens within the university community. Um, we had some positive movement in the last bargaining session, but like it is a priority that you know, all of the bargaining proposals that the graduate workers have brought to the table, all of the 14 different um, bargaining goals that are outlined on, on, the universe, on the union website and like what we are pushing for, all of that gets engaged with seriously and with consideration from the university because all of those represent serious problems that graduate workers have identified. And if there was a, if, there, if these solutions existed outside of this space, that they wouldn't be problems that we were bringing to the bargaining table. So we wanted to like just really emphasize those two points, expeditious bargaining, engaging with every single one of our proposals so that we get to a fair contract as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Next in line, Willow Cunningham. Hello, I'm uh, Willow Cunningham. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student at the University of Maine, Orono. I'm addressing the board today in order to request that the University of Maine take action against the genocide that is per currently being perpetuated against the Palestinian people by the Israeli government. As of February of this year, the death toll in Gaza has surpassed 30,000 lives. 43% of those killed have been children. Um, and this is a direct consequence of Israel's invasion of Gaza. On March 26, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Territories reported that there is reasonable ground to state that, the, that Israel is committing genocide against the Palestinian people. If you have been paying attention to social media for these last few months, you will have seen the Palestinian people documenting their own genocide live on social media. Um, even now, after the United Nations ordered a ceasefire for the remainder of the month of Ramadan, the killing continues. The day after being ordered to withdraw, Israel continued its bombardment of Gaza, killing 81 Palestinians and injuring 93 more. On April 2nd, seven days after the ceasefire had been ordered, an Israel airstrike uh, killed seven foreign aid workers of the World Central Kitchen. Um, the stream of war crimes cannot be tolerated. So in the past, the University of Maine was one of the first universities to completely divest from apartheid South Africa in 1982 as part of a national divestment campaign to put pressure on the apartheid state. The Human Rights Watch, Bet Salam, and Amnesty International have declared that the treatment of Palestinians in the land occupied by Israel amounts to the crime against humanity of apartheid. In order to remain consistent with our past action, the university uh, should join schools like uh, Tufts, Stanford, and Princeton in divesting from companies that profit from and support Israel's occupation of Palestinian land. The companies in particular that should be divested from are Elbit Systems, Intel, HD Huyandani, Volvo, CAT, JCB, Barclays, Chevron, Noble Energy, CAF, Hikvision, and TKH Security. Um, Given the growing international pressure for Israel to end inhumane practices these companies exploit, it may be more profitable to invest in the space or transportation sectors instead. 
And uh, finally, on the divestment point, it's actually very difficult to find out what the University of Maine is investing in. Um, so it would be lovely if that were made public so that we could hold this uh, university more accountable. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jacob Hines. Hello, I'm Jacob Hines, the president of the new uh, Jewish Voice for Peace student club at UMA and Orna. And so I grew up in a, you know, reformed Jewish household, belonged to a Zionist synagogue and did the whole uh, thing. <laughs> My mom was even present while we were transitioning from renting space to having our own building. Um, and, uh, you know, I came to realize uh my political education that a lot of what I'd been taught about Israel uh, was a lie with no mention of Palestine or the occupied territories. Um, you know, so the conditions that, you know, the uh, Israel, you know, so contrary to like what people might have heard on the news, uh, Israel's not really targeting Hamas. That's just rhetorical cover. Israel's been using an AI system uh, named Where's Daddy that targets and bombs suspected terrorists as they enter their family homes surrounded by children and women. So far in Gaza, Israel has killed 200 plus aid workers, 100 plus journalists, 13,000 children, and is using starvation as a weapon of war. Uh, well, up until recently, at least. As Israelis block aid trucks with IDF support uh, on the border of Gaza. So the real problem in Israel isn't like the terrorism, just like the real problem in South Africa wasn't the ANC's terrorism or in Ireland, the IRA's terrorism. It was the real problem was the violent occupation. Israel's illegal blockade of Gaza created an open-air prison where Israel controls the food, water, electricity, and everything else that goes in and out of Gaza, and as such is the root cause of the violence. 70% of Gaza's or population are refugees that were displaced in the original Nakba, the which was the ethnic cleansing campaign that founded Israel. 50% um, of Gaza's population are under the age of 18. How did that happen? You know, pretty worthy question. And all, pretty much all Palestinians in Gaza have not been allowed to leave since the blockade started, except under rare special permission. Uh, the West Bank resembles the Jim Crow South, where roads are segregated, IDF soldiers maintain checkpoints for traveling Palestinians. Anyway, yeah, so all of this is to say that we, um, we're we urging the university to join the BDS campaign and divest from the company's Elbit Systems, Intel, High, HD Hyundai, Volvo, CAT, JCB, Barclays, Chevron, Chevron owned Noble Energy, CAF, Hikvision, and TKH, as this university was one of the first to divest from South African apartheid back in 82. We should, uh, you know, continue that legacy. Thanks. Thank you. We have we have Megan Slavalik and Elsa Malarski is on deck. Hi, I am Megan Sarbalik, a student at UMA and Orno, who among many others has been following the attacks in Gaza for months now. Following the initiative that the school has undergone divesting from fossil fuels and leading divestment from South African apartheid, I implore you to address the moral conflict of investing in Israel. The oppressive methods of Israel's 55 year regime in Palestine have been deemed apartheid by many human rights organizations. And the recent actions only highlight these claims. During the conflict in Gaza, around 33,000 Palestinian civilians have died and hundreds of thousands are currently starving. For these reasons, students are increasingly seeking solidarity for Palestine and the university can take action by removing their investments from companies complicit in Israel's war crimes. 
I would like to address also that the BDS movement is select and who today rest from and targets companies who have significant roles in the unethical occupation in Palestine. While Humane's investments might seem small scale, the intentions and actions of our schools matter. Thank you. Thank you. Elsa, Elsa Malarski, followed by Stephen Santiago. Hello, my name is Elsa Malarski. I'm the vice president and co-founder of the Humane Orono chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace. I was raised in an interfaith family with an agnostic Jewish father and a non-practicing Catholic mother, but I have come to consider myself proudly and authentically Jewish. Some might say that my being here speaking to you doesn't make me a real Jew, that a real Jew supports Israel, but I disagree. My being here is intrinsic to the, my Jewish identity and the principle of tikkun olam, healing the world. The conditions in occupied Palestine are nothing short of horrific. In the past six months, I have seen more images of dead children and read more testimonies of cruelty and starvation than anyone ever should. There's only one word for what is happening, genocide, something that there is never an excuse for, no matter what. And I say this not only as a decent human being, but as a cultural anthropology major. And culturally, it just narrows the human experience. We study the horrors of the Holocaust and read Anne Frank and Elie Wiesel. We talk of land acknowledgments and recognizing the sovereignty of indigenous people. We'll be studying on Wabanaki land with our flagship be campus being located on the ancestral island home of the Penobscot people. While the Penobscot tribe's current reservation is located on the island that was their ancestral burial ground. When it comes to Palestine, the university has been silent. In fact, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Orono which has been one of our biggest allies since our chapter form, has recently been told they are not allowed to speak on Palestine in order to keep the campus an inclusive place for everyone. But does the concept of everyone also not include our Palestinian or other Arab or Muslim students? There's a quote from someone whose name I can't remember about the paradox of tolerance. Imagine you have a sheep pen with a sign on it that says open to everyone. Eventually wolves will start to enter the sheep pen and kill the sheep. And when the sheep complain about being killed and eaten, you point to the sign that says, open to everyone, and explain that you can't exclude the wolves because that will make you as intolerant as them. So the wolves continue coming in and killing the sheep, and soon you have a space that is only wolves. To be tolerant, one must be intolerant of intolerance. Right now, Gaza, as well as all of Palestine, is our sheep, and we are catering to the wolves. Some may tell you that Zionism, the support of a Jewish state, is inherent to the Jewish identity, that you can't be Jewish without supporting Israel, but this is wrong. Those of us who have founded this club say otherwise, that Judaism is not intrinsically tied with Zionism and neither vice versa, that this is not an issue of excluding Jewish students, but an issue of including everyone and stopping bigotry and fascism. So we ask you to support all of our students and divest from companies that support these horrible actions, whatever they may be. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Santiago, followed by Matt Marks. Howdy trustees, I'm Steven Santiago. I'm a fifth year student in my graduating semester. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I speak not as an embodiment of any movement, but rather from my own personal viewing position, educated in social analysis by this university. I have pre prepared a substantive uh, comment that I will submit electronically to this board um, but I have also prepared an abstract of my comments that I will read to you now. Herein, I address concerns that I've picked up throughout my university career. As a function of our government, UMaine should be accessible to a host of publics. I address areas of concern where I see this mission failing. Namely, I feel as though the university, at the direction of the board, is hurrying towards an exclusionary future as a continuation of our state's colonialist mission. The skills we train students in will be used for the rest of their lives. We should make sure we are not teaching, uh, we are teaching them not to be complicit in or to justify evil, but rather to lead toward an intersectional just form of justice and peace. 
If we are not striving for such meritorious ways of being, what is it that we are striving for? How do we accomplish a virtuous character for our university and colleges? I attempt a conjecture based on my personal experience of formal education. And now I will read my call to action, which you will find in the document. Finally, I envision a reworking of general education and requirements to increase consciousness of and conscientiousness towards large scale social problems. I would mandate studies in the field of collective action problems. I would center studies and narratives of gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, religion, and class, so that students, regardless of program, develop a critical awareness of and toolkit for these challenges. Instead of forcing students to reinvent the wheel every generation, this proposal, in my mind, will give future students the opportunity to develop tools, skills, and know-how to tackle the phenomenal social problems of our age. Skills like organizing, logistics, and public civic leadership to tackle and abolish the crises of our and of all ages, poverty, inequality, inequity, bullionaires, and genocide. How can anyone solve these problems without recognition of their forms and genres? How can anyone imagine a better world if they are never shown that such a world is not only possible, but probable? One need not have a specialist understanding of the social domain, narrow and deep, but anybody could stand to adopt a generalist approach, broad and cursory. One does not need to be a poet of this domain, but they should be familiar with common parlance. And that's all my time. Thank you, right on time, thank you. Sure, that's great. Yep, we can, we'd be happy to copy that. Okay, great, thank you. Matt Marks. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and see so many familiar faces uh, leading the UMaine board. Uh, my name is Matt Marks, and I'm here on behalf of the Associated General Contractors of Maine. Uh, AGC Maine is a commercial construction trade association that I've had the pleasure of working with for 15 years. I'm also a proud graduate of the UMaine system. I want to thank the university for investing in infrastructure and AGC Maine's partnership They've been receptive to contractor feedback, engaged, and offered innovative shovel-ready projects, which we love. The competitive procurement process for 44 projects in 2023 resulted in $143 million in construction and engineering services. It's a tremendous asset to the people of Maine. I had the honor a few years ago to serve on a legislative committee charged with examining higher education facilities led by Chancellor Malloy. Uh, that work introduced me to the very deliberative process that the system has adopted to make informed decisions in improving facilities and tackling deferred maintenance. The system is a clear leader in their data-driven strategic approach. A few years ago, I attended a national public-private partnership conference where it was clear that facilities make a major difference in both educational experiences, but also college selection. As a dad, I can confirm that's one of the clear differences students and parents notice when they start college tours. One of the tough decisions you are all faced with is divesting of assets that no longer meet the need or underutilized. And I wanna share that we believe in the mission and appreciate the due diligence and fortitude of the board to get that job done. As you might expect, AGC May members value the recent investments made at UMaine for the important role it plays in keeping skilled workers employed, but also competitiveness that it delivers uh, for the workforce. The university is a strategic partner in our goal to hire, educate, and retain that skilled workforce. Since the late 1980s, AGC Maine delivered the majority of our scholarships to students at the UMaine system, funded innovative programs, and supported efforts across the system. The university must remain strong in order for our growth to continue. Lastly, we remain encouraged and enthusiastic about the innovation developed by the university from construction materials to partnering on new construction techniques. We value and remain confident that our partnership will continue in the future and look forward to new ideas to improve the construction industry. I appreciate the time today to share AGC Maine's comments. I want to thank each of you for serving in your capacity here on the board, and I hope you have a wonderful solar eclipse day. <laughs> thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> Let me let me thank everyone for their eloquent comments and let you know that we will be we do believe in transparency and we will provide information about our um, expenditures pursuant to your request.
let's uh, move on. Thanking everyone. A um, couple of just announcements that you'll note the chancellor is not physically with us. He We changed our date and uh, it, it therefore conflicted with the very important accreditation of the uh, University of Maine Law School of Law. So the ABA is there visiting and so is the chancellor and we welcome him online um, and appreciate that that's a very important undertaking. <laughs> Um, I also want to take just a minute um, to commend President Farini Mundy. Some of you may have noticed that the uh, main biz has named her the business leader of the year, which is quite an accomplishment um, for, uh, for an academic. It's bad. And it reflects well on all the extraordinary work underway at, at the University of Maine. Um, and let me also re uh, welcome our new student representative, Tristan Mitchell from the University of Maine at Farmington. We'll be voting on you officially a little bit later and take this minute to thank Aiden for his long, well, Rooney for his long service. He's been a terrific, terrific student representative. And we're, we'll, we'll miss you, but we expect to see you in new new ways throughout your career. With that, let me turn the meeting over to the University of Maine at Augusta. We're very pleased to be here, and President Cushman is going to take us on a little, little tour here. Good morning, and welcome to the University of Maine at Augusta. Um, today, we'd like to continue what we started yesterday evening to shine a light on UMA student diversity. And we will have a student panel, so you'll hear directly from the students. And But we're going to begin with a short overview of student demographics from our Dean of Students, Jennifer Davis. Hi, everybody. Lovely to see you again. So I will zoom through these slides for the sake of time. Uh, again, just wanted to be here today to speak a little bit about the really, I think, surprising sometimes breadth of diversity that we see in our student population here at UMA. So uh, this is data reflected of summer 22, fall 22, and spring 23. Um, but you'll see that we have uh, significant diversity in our population of students in regard to age. We, in fact, have a 47% non-traditional age student population. And then on the other side of that, we have 24% of our student population who are under 18. This does include our early college population. We have significant diversity in regard to location. So you'll see that uh, we have students represented all across the state. As many of you know, we have 12% on our Augusta campus, 7% in Bangor, 16% at our UMA sites and centers, and then 65% who are uh, living in or experiencing their learning online. So again, significant diversity that we see in our modality and campus affiliation. In regard to gender identification, we have 32% of students who are identifying as female, 33% as male, and 5% as unknown. Uh, and so we do have diversity in gender, but a surprisingly high female identifying population, although we are seeing that throughout higher ed. Uh, in regard to racial and ethnic identification, uh, we have, uh, not surprisingly, an 81% uh, identifying as white student population, but we do also have uh, other ethnicities that are represented, 4.2% uh, identifying as Hispanic and Latino. Uh, we have 3.2% represented in our Black and African American population. Uh, and then you can see the other numbers there. Also, I do want to mention that we have a significant new Mainer population that are not necessarily reflected in this data. We have 45% of our students are first generation. So these are individuals whose uh, parents did not complete college. So we have some significant diversity of, fami of familial or college context. So again, students coming to us uh, without necessarily a whole lot of familial awareness of the higher education setting. We have 63% of our students are Pell eligible. So very significant diversity of economic resources and class privilege. Uh, we have a 71% dependency status, or in regard to dependency status, we have 71% of our students who are independent. Uh, and so again, this is representing diversity of the level of parental support. Many of our students come to us here at UMA uh, and they are truly on their own, other than what we are here to help them uh, in the ways that we help them. And then in regard to residency, uh, although 91% of our students are in state, we have 8% who are out of state. And so this is a growing student population for UMA. Uh, and a 1% international student population. So we do see diversity in our regional culture. Uh, we have a 4.7% veteran population. You'll hear from some of our student veterans today, indicating significant diversity in lived experience. 32% of our students are parents. 
and 2% identify as dependents who uh, have who, individuals who have dependents who are not children. And so this really indicates a pretty significant diversity in bandwidth. Um, many more traditional universities, as we all know, uh, have students who are really able to prioritize their education as their first priority. And here at UMA, uh, we have students who are really juggling multiple responsibilities. We also have a very significant develop, developmental learner population. So 10% of our students uh, are enrolled in math who are enrolled in our math courses uh, were in fact in developmental courses. And so we have very significant diversity in regard to the quantitative uh, ability and sort of experience that we see in our students. And then finally, uh, many of you are aware of our prison, prison education partnership. And so we actually have 2.5% of UMA students uh, who are living in residence in the carceral system, uh, which indicates really significant diversity in living and learning. Uh, and then finally, as an open access institution, we do have a 99% acceptance rate. And so uh, in regard to the time, en time of enrollment as well, we have students who are entering from many different places, 34% are first time students, 46% are transfer, we have an 18% readmit, 2% of graduate students, and then 20% of early college. And so our 99% acceptance rate really does indicate pretty significant diverse, diversity in academic preparedness. So we have students, in addition to those who are coming to us as an open access institution, we also have some very competitive programs. Uh, and then finally, status at time of enrollment does indicate for us that we have diversity in previous experience in college. So students are coming in sometimes for the very first time, uh, others coming with some uh, college experience inherent. And that is it for me. Uh, so now we're going to move on to hearing from our students, the more fun part of this presentation. Uh, and our first student is actually joining us via a video uh, from one of our UMA centers. And then after we hear from Joyce, we'll hear from some of our students here in the room. Thanks. Greetings from the South Center. My name is Yi Yang Jiang. You can call me Joyce. My current major is Business Administration, BS. I am a non traditional student studying to be a content, BS. So far, I have received all A's for my work and received a Rising Scholar Award last year. I'm sorry that I could not be with you in August for the meeting. My husband and I live in Old Orchard Beach. I studied at the Saka OOB Adult Learning Center for ESOL. And the teacher, Ms. Melissa, suggested that I pursue a degree at UMA. Saka Center was within 10 minutes of our home. So we decided to enroll. We have only one car, and the trips to the other campus would have been nearly impossible. In China, I was not able to go to university. My father died at an early age, so I began a career as a frozen seafood exporter, mostly to the Middle East and Europe, to support my mom and my younger sister. Once past the college age, attending college in China was impossible. I had no time to think of a family beyond my immediate family. But in 2016, my husband and I met, married in China, and immigrated to Maine. We worked together in our China medical market research business until the pandemic. But now, we are retired and living on a fixed income. Without scholarships and the Sato Center, we would not be able to afford the education. In September, my husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, making my education and future career even more important. As you might guess, this journey was very new for me. The Sato Center has been essential in helping me navigate the policies and provide workspace for me. 
attending classes on live Zoom and relying on waiting alone does not provide face-to-face -face -face learning and chatting with professors, advisors, and fellow students that enrich the learning experience. Another reason I find UMA to be a great choice is the low tuition rate. The tuition is very affordable, and I would not be able to attend college if it was more expensive. I can't say enough about how important this cycle center of UMA has been for me. I have to finish the requirements for my AS degree this fall or 2025 spring and continue toward a BS. Losing the support of Sako Center would be devastating to me. I'm sure there are others in the same boat. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thought with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Heidi Toner, and I am a first year graduate student at the University of Maine in Augusta. I study on the Bangor campus. I also just recently um, finished my undergraduate program through UMA. Um, I'm also a 43 year old woman, single mom, who um, decided to come to UMA in 2020 due to COVID and my job being lost due to downsizing. Um, at that time, my daughter was a senior in high school and I'm a first generational student. So I thought it was best to show them that education is extremely important. So I decided to return to school. Um, the response for me from COVID was personal as it, like I said, it resulted in my unemployment. Um, it was during that time that I noticed a shift in myself. Um, it was at the center of my core and who I was. Um, but upon returning to school, I really noticed that shift. Um, from an incredibly early age, um, one of my core values and purposes in life was to help others. Um, and because of that, I decided to do my undergraduate studies in mental health and human services, um, addiction counseling, and um, continued on with that path. My long-term goal was to advocate on behalf of um, adolescents and teens um, affected from substance use disorder. Um, since my time at UMA, that has shifted to more of a social advocacy and a perspective of trauma um, informed practices in higher education. My goal is to someday come back and actually teach for UMA. That's my long-term goal. So throughout my time at UMA, I made it essential focus to be involved. Um, as a non-traditional student beginning at the age of 40, I decided to get involved in the Student Government Association, which was quite scary considering as, mu as much as we have um, a big non-traditional population, most of the people in student government were of my children's age. <laughs> so it was a big risk for me to take. Um, and through that process, I involved myself in a lot of executive board um, positions, pushing myself and pushing myself. At one point I was um, student body president um, for the Bangor campus. I've done different roles this year. I'm vice president because I stepped back as I um, joined graduate school, but I'm also the parliamentary chair. Um, and that's because policy is extremely important for me. Um, as a part of the team, I've been able to, um, I used, I worked with the, um, from an assistance of the main hunger dialogues, we've done a lot of things like we packaged up snacks during COVID and had lunches available for our students. We also purchased a smart TV for our student lounge in Bangor. And that was allowing us to hold lunch and learns. A lot of the things that happen at UMA happen on the Augusta campus. And by purchasing that TV, we were able to put that out to the masses. Like we said, we have a lot of center students. We have students that want to be a, feel a part of the university on the Bangor campus and allowed us to join together. Um, in my senior year of my undergraduate studies, I began to learn more about policy work, such as um, my involvement with outside organizations, as well as parliamentary chair for the General Assembly. Through working in this endeavor, the committee created um, or has amended several policies, as well as begun to um, investigate the restructuring of our, our of our entire student government. It's a very diverse population, so we need to take a look at it. Um, as a senior project that was funded by um, our diver uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, I began to do some research on stigma and presented my work on campus regarding food insecurity, housing insecurity, and mental health amongst our college student population. 
Um, this is actually being expanded this year to include things such as substance use disorder and the use of trauma-informed approaches on our campus. Um, also this year, I began my graduate studies. So like I said, I'm a first year graduate student. I'm in the trauma emergency management field with a focus on mental health. Um, and for my capstone, I am uh, looking at the effects of housing insecurity specifically on college students. Um, this was sparked by a current situation. If anybody's familiar on the Bangor campus, there's an unhousing campus. That's right, um, as borders our campus. As an advocate for both that student, our student population and the UMA as a whole, I recently spoke at Bangor City Hall on behalf of our students' concerns. Um, I've also seen a number, I've also been a member of the Unhoused Action Committee, a committee that was created on the Bangor campus two years ago to see what we can do for that local community. Um, through my work with that community, as well as other um, work with other staff and faculty, which is, has been a baby of mine since I started um, at UMA, we're finally bringing um, Narcan training to UMA um, in May, actually. So I, that's like my highlight of my career at UMA. <laughs> Through my work with this committee, um, we found ways to incorporate um, additional studies on stigma reduction, as well as that naloxone training. Finding ways to incorporate my studies to improve both UMA and my local community has been a passion of mine over the last few years. It is through my involvement in those projects that I feel the most connected. UMA for me is like a second home. And in many, the many people I've met during that time feel like family to me. So I'm so grateful for my experiences and opportunity, the opportunities that UMA has afforded me. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Samantha Thornton, but I go by Sammy. I'm in my I'm 19 and I'm from Chelsea, Maine. Currently I'm in my second year here, but I'm a junior credit wise, going for a bachelor's degree in social science with a concentration in psychology here at UMA. I'm still figuring out what I want to do after graduation, but for now I'm enjoying being involved in various activities on campus. My engagement with the university community these past two years has been full of fun and rewarding work. This past fall, I joined our newly established women's soccer team and became one of the captains trying to help grow the program. Creating bonds on and off the field has helped. And additionally, I have been happy to work as a student employee in the admissions office for my two years here. I get to engage with both current and potential students, giving them tours and helping out in any way I can. Outside of students, I've been able to connect with the amazing staff in the office who provide me with levels of support and give me connections that I wouldn't have made otherwise. Being able to socialize in a small university is important, and this has helped me build a supportive community within. Off campus, I also serve as one of the CAs or community advisor in the UMA dorms located in Hollowell, where I live in the Erskine building. Not only do I get to interact with students on campus, but I also get to do so throughout all three dorm buildings. Within this role, I get to make meaningful connections, plan activities, and even drive a shuttle van, which can be scary. Most, mo But most of all, I'm lucky to be a part of the incredible team that the seven of us form collectively helping to make the dorm experience enjoyable. The dorms are honestly the best I have seen compared to other colleges I've visited. I have a single room, which includes a kitchen with a full fridge, oven, and microwave, and a bathroom with a shower, meaning I don't have to share. The bathroom even has a heater, which has helped keep me and my room warm. Moving along, one of the most asked questions as a senior in high school is, what college are you going to? For some people, that's an, easy, that's an easy question to answer because they know what they want to go for and decide based on their major. For me, it wasn't that easy. I didn't know what I wanted to do, not like I know right now either, but I knew I didn't want to choose a major just to choose. I decided I want to go in undecided and figure it out along the way. One of the things that I like about UMA is that they offer a huge variety of majors, which gave me some relief and took some pressure off. Another reason why I chose UMA is because of the affordability. I applied to four different colleges and got into all of them, but UMA was the cheapest out of them. For me, it didn't make sense to pay more money to a different college for an undecided major. Another reason I came here is because of the smallness. I come from a small community in high school, so I was looking for something similar. Coming into college, I thought I wanted everything in person. My first semester, I had a mix of in-person and online classes, and after that, I realized I wanted the opposite, all online. I really like that UMA is flexible and offers a variety of in-person and online classes for people all over to take. This brings me to the amount of access and support we have here as students. 
First of all, every professor I've had has been great with helping students. They have office hours for us and will make time to help us outside of those hours if needed. Shout out to Professor Lorraine Lake Corral for being an amazing professor. I love the way she teaches her classes and I have taken multiple, multiple of them in person and online. She is just great overall. She helps students succeed and knows what we need to better ourselves. My favorite thing about her class setup is that she provides lecture outlines to relieve us of some writing so we can pay more attention and understand what she's saying. The next type of access and support we have here is through the food bank. Every Tuesday, UMA gets food deliveries that offers students free groceries. We also have a food cupboard at the dorms as well. Additionally, for me, a huge part of accessibility and support comes from the admissions office. Ariel Casista, a staff member in the office, has been my rock throughout my college experience since day one. She's helped me with everything, and I am extremely grateful to have her in my life now. I also get free swag, which is an added bonus. I went into college in the admissions office, very shy and reserved. Since then, it has allowed me to be more social and involved. Overall, my entire college experience has helped me become the person that I am today, and I couldn't be more thankful for the experiences, friendships, and opportunities that UMA has provided for me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonas Smith. I am 20 years old and I am from Orlando, Florida. I am a third year junior here at UMA studying business administration. Some may ask why UMA being so far from home and I truly have many answers. I played basketball all throughout high school and was recruited to many schools and ultimately chose the University of Maine at Augusta. As I was looking at other options, I looked to see if my tender major was taught, the residence life plus where I was going to live, and most importantly to me, the community. Going down my list and checking off all the boxes for UMA, I stumbled across the dorm student life slash community, and that is exactly what sold me and solidified UMA as my final decision. Not only was I getting a great community to surround myself with, but I was also getting a state-of-the-art dorm room with a heater. I mentioned before, I am from Florida, so this coldness is not something I'm used to. On a personal note, the dorms are beautiful, eye-catching, spacious, unlike anything that I have ever seen. Now moving on to the community and student life aspect of the residence halls. Back then, many, many years ago, when I was a freshman, two years ago, coming from Florida, I didn't know many people or anyone other than my coaches and teammates that had reached out to me ahead of time. That was until the community advisors or the CAs had approached me and told me about the opening programs that were going to happen in the upcoming days as I was moving in with my parents. Being a shy and withdrawn teenager in a state where I didn't know anyone, I didn't think much of these programs. As the days got much closer, I'd receive reminder emails about these programs from my assigned CA and I started to think more and more about them. The day came and I heard a knock on my door hours before the program started. I opened the door not thinking much of it and it was my CA letting me know that I should go and it would be a great opportunity to meet new people. Time goes by, maybe a couple hours, and I end up showing up and meeting my fellow students and residents. We started with name games and as we got to know each other a bit more, you could see the unification and togetherness between everyone. From that moment on, I felt like I belonged and it kind of resonated with me which is now I am my second year of being a community advisor under my great boss, Kim Keniston. As community advisors, we aspire and try to create a unified environment in these residence halls. There are a handful of things that we do in that process, whether it is creating and performing the programs that reach out to all residents, weekly check-ins, driving a shuttle to campus and stores for those who don't have any sorts of transportation and a lot more. I do take it a bit personal because without that CA having an effort to come reach out to me to get to come reach out to me and go to that program, my freshman year would have panned out extremely different. I wanted everyone to be able to feel wanted, to feel like they fit in and generally be a part of a bigger community the same way I did. Having Kim and amazing staff at LCAs makes this experience for me much more amusing and enjoyable. The accessibility and support that UMA obtains was also another deciding factor on why I am here today. Being a basketball player and a community advisor are two roles that can take up a lot of time and create a busy schedule. Throughout all my years, Freshmen up to this very point, all of my classes have been online and they have all been great. I've even taken some classes over the summer while I was back home and I was able to understand and show mastery of the concepts being taught to me. As a student here at UMA, I appreciate the flexibility and compliance the school offers throughout its courses, even while being an online student. The professors have been great and understand the schedule that I have and the different resources that are available and present to myself and others are extremely helpful and accommodating. Overall, UMA has provided me with the tools necessary for success and guided me through what could have been a tough path to obtaining my degree in the near future. 
The experiences, opportunities, and people that I have met along the way have molded me into that man that I am today. I couldn't be more grateful for them all. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, members of the Board of Trustees. My name is Raquel Shaw, and I'm currently a junior in my college journey here at the University of Maine at Augusta. Originally from Lincoln, Maine, I now reside in the dormitories in Hollowell. I am a traditional student as I am 19 and came to UMA straight out of high school. As a first generation student coming from a low income household, the decision to pursue higher education was something I always had my mind set on. UMA stood out to me due to its cost efficiency and the opportunities it offered. When I was in the process of deciding between different schools, the financial aspect was overwhelming. With the guidance of a trusted high school teacher, we sifted through various financial packages, trying to understand the potential debt I could incur. Upon exploring UMA, I was pleasantly surprised by the reasonable numbers. The prospect of dormitories equipped with full-size kitchens sealed the deal for me, prompting me to commit to the school and apply for housing as soon as I could. Living in the dorms has been a learning experience for me. Embracing the roommate dynamic has taught me the value of understanding that your roommates do not have to be your best friends. But it's important to have someone to debrief with after a long day. I formed close bonds with international exchange students and actively participated in numerous on-campus programs like attending museums in Portland, cultural days, and volunteering for our spring carnival. I have also tried to take advantage of the opportunities here on campus, like our tutoring, counseling, and writing services. When taking on the role of a community advisor or a CA, I missed the daily interactions with roommates. Nevertheless, serving as a CA has been a rewarding experience. While I initially gravitated towards the position for the opportunity to plan programs and engage with residents, I've come to appreciate the sense of community it shares. From organizing outings to local yoga studios, to promoting attendance at, the, at athletic events through creative posters, I've strived to enhance the dorm experience for my fellow residents. I cherish the moments spent conversing with residents during shuttle runs and programming activities, as they provide invaluable opportunities for connection and support. I've prioritized promoting healthy relationships and personal growth among residents. I've done a program where I invited Tasia to be a guest speaker and to share insight on maintaining balanced relationships. This program has been one of my highlights as my time as a CA. Communicating with each other without judgment is an essential component of a thriving campus community. As a first generation student coming from a low income background, I bring a unique perspective to UMA. My experiences have taught me the importance of empathy, understanding, inclusive, and inclusivity. Having and creating proper support systems is difficult in the transition to college. I am committed to advocating for the needs and concerns of all students, regardless of their background or circumstances. By creating a culture of acceptance, we can provide a more welcoming and supportive environment for everyone. In conclusion, my journey at UMA has been defined by a commitment to academic excellence, community engagement, and personal growth. I am dedicated to advocating for things that enhance the dorm experience and share a supportive environment for all residents. I am grateful for the opportunity to address you, the Board of Trustees, today, and I look forward to contributing to the continued success and development of our university. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Baker. I am a 47-year-old Army veteran from Northern Maine. I believe that makes me the old guy, so I'm pretty psyched about that. <laughs> I'm here this morning to talk a little bit about the veteran perspective at UMA. Um, like many veterans, when I came home from my service, I was broken both physically and mentally. And like many veterans, I was trained to push down the mental injuries and kind of ignore them and just drive on. Uh, as you can imagine, that leads to a very dark path, which eventually led to my life completely falling apart about seven years ago. Uh, during the rebuilding process of my life, I moved to the Augusta area. And when it came time to what's next, uh, the thing that really stuck in my mind is every time I would pass the campus going back and forth through town, I'd see the welcome veteran sign. Uh, so I started asking around about that, and I was told two things. Number one, UMA has a dedicated veteran center on campus. And two, I really needed to speak to Amy Lyon. 
Uh, so in January of 2020, I reached out to Amy Line, and for those of you that know Amy, from there it was buckle up and hold on, because with Amy, there's no looking back. Um, when speaking about the center itself, uh, the first thing really need to know is the physical aspect of it. Um, through donations and grants, no expense was spared when they came to designing the place. They brought in experts from the VA, including mental health experts, from the paint colors being chosen to provide the calming atmosphere, from uh, our ceiling lights are LED instead of fluorescent, so there's no flickering. The desks in there are all adjustable for those of us with the back and joint issues. Uh, it's all designed to make the veteran feel comfortable and safe, having their own area to come to that they can just kind of retreat from the world a little bit and decompress. Um, when we get them into that place, uh, we want to make sure that the focus is taken off everything else to allow them to just focus on the education factor of being at school. And one of the ways we do that is we keep our own stock of office supplies, donated textbooks. We have our own kitchenette and pantry to make sure food security is not an issue with the veterans. It's really just being able to focus on your education. We're going to take care of everything else for you. Once we get the veterans to where they're comfortable being on campus, we start introducing them to activities. Um, if you ask most veterans and they're being honest with you, you'll find that what they miss the most from their military service is the camaraderie. The relationships that were forged during that military time are unlike anything you'll make anywhere else. And once that is taken away from them, there can be some devastating consequences to that. So what we do is we start planning events in the center. We start having cookouts, barbecues. We have lunch and learns. We have informal events just to get people to engage and come in and spend time on campus and be comfortable being on campus. When we get them to that point, we start introducing them to the campus and introducing the campus to them because that can be interesting too. Uh, we hold events such as potlucks, we do other gatherings, we have multimedia plays, we do movies, we have veteran authors come in and do readings. Uh, one of our bigger events is we host the 9-11 Memorial March. And what we do is we invite people to come in and decorate a brick with either a victim's name, their thoughts on the tragedy. And then we actually have a pre-planned route that we march up to the 9-11 Memorial, place those, take a moment of reflection. Uh, this year, we actually were honored to have Professor J Jerry Gamash join us. He was actually the spearhead memorial in the first place. So it was nice to let him get some recognition for that. And then we come back to the HHRC and we usually have a multimedia presentation about the events to let people have time to reflect on it. Uh, we also do, instead of just a Veterans Day, we do Veterans Week. We plan multiple events from flag foldings to marches to everything else in between to make sure that anyone on campus or anyone in the public, you don't have to make sure, oh, I can't be there that day. That's fine. Come the next day. We got something going on then. It gives you multiple opportunities to come in, pay your respects, thank a veteran. Uh, we also keep a permanent POW MIA table right in the center so they ne are never forgotten. Uh, the university also takes the time at non-patriotic events to make sure the veterans are recognized. Uh, there is a recognition at the convocations and the graduations. We have special clothes for the veterans to wear. So the, the university really does stick to that welcome veterans. Um, as a final note, the center is just a center. It's a physical space. What makes this campus veteran friendly are the people. Um, it can be intimidating to enter our space People kind of scared of what they might walk into when they come into the Veterans Center. But I do highly encourage you do. Um, the people that have made the effort to come in quickly get adopted into our little dysfunctional family. So it works out great. So I always encourage people to come in because if not for those people, I would not be standing here today as a recent graduate with a bachelor's degree in mental health and human services. I thank you for your time today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Grace Hills. I am a sophomore in the veterinary technology program at our beautiful Bangor campus. I'm considered a non-traditional first-generational student. I'm also Hispanic and have dual citizenship in the United States and in Chile. 
a couple of years ago, when I was looking for a place to attend university, there were a couple of must-haves that I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> Number one was a place with small classes. Number two, a university close to home. And number three, affordability. UMA checked all three of those boxes. As my U UMA journey progressed, I learned that UMA was so much more than the check boxes that you look for for what university you want to attend. When I walked through the halls on campus, I found student life very inviting and was surprised by what was to offer to students outside of classes. To this day, I still see our coordinators of student life lighten up when new students arrive. Academically, I found that teachers can have a much more one-on-one -on -one engagement with students when you have smaller classes. Being able to conversate with my professors has changed and improved my academic career significantly. Being here, I've learned that UMA is known for its adaptability and accessibility to many non-traditional students. Most importantly, UMA wants to hear the voices of their students our newly appointed President Cushman has shown that from holding town hall meetings to emailing the members of the SGAs and with setting up student forums. Thank you. During my time at UMA, I've had a couple of challenges along the way, aside from trying to figure out who I was as an independent adult. During my time as a freshman, I had COVID that later resulted in me getting sick constantly for six months, roughly. This year, I once again had COVID and the concussion that put me out of work and school for roughly five weeks. Even when I felt like every assignment and task was a challenge, I started to feel burnt out as well. UMA's faculty and staff showed that their jobs aren't just a paycheck and that they actually want to see a student succeed. Alongside some of the great professors that I've had, I've had TRIO provide extraordinary advice and support to not just me, but to other non-traditional students on campus and online every day. Currently, I hold the chair of the General Assembly position, and I am the Bangor Student Government Association president. Aside from that, I'm also on a number of committees. Being a part of the student government and other entities on campus has made my experience at UMA better than I ever thought it could be. I've been able to advocate and provide for events and activities for students. I've learned leadership. I've grown within myself and I have a supportive group of students to go through my college career with, including Heidi Toner. Aside from what I've learned academically here at UMA, one of the most important things that I've learned while being here is that you can't ask for change and not be a part of it. My experiences here will guide me for the rest of my life and academic journey. Thank you so much. Good morning to the Board of Trustees. Uh, my name is Benjamin Demerchant. I am a 36-year-old non-traditional uh, Marine Corps veteran. Um, and I am a first, uh, I'm, I'm going to school for the first time, first generation. As I stand before you today, reflecting on my journey of University of Maine Augusta, being a non-traditional student comes with its unique challenges, set of challenges. But thanks to the warm welcome and the support I received, those challenges have transformed into opportunities growth and empowerment. The Veterans Center here at UMA has been a comfortable place for me to go, not only for my classes, but to visit when I'm struggling. Um, this is where camaraderie and understanding thrive. It's more than just the physical space, it's community where we can come together, share experiences and support one another through our academic and personal journeys. Whether it's, catchy, whether it's catching up on classwork or lending a helping hand to the fellow student, the veteran the Veterans Center has become a cornerstone to my university experience. One of the most ex impactful experiences I've had here was participating in the Summit Project. Um, this is where we walked around the UMA campus with a memory of fallen Maine soldiers. Um, we had stones that were dedicated by their families with the hero's name written on the stone and their um, rank. Um, and so, Walking around the UMA campus in memory of these fallen soldiers was a beautiful reminder of the sacrifices, sacrifices made by those who had served our country. Despite the event being put together on short notice, it was a, tes a testament to Amy Line, who, whose name has been mentioned earlier, has been instrumental in, in getting me into UMA and providing me with the things that I needed. Um, it has been a testament to the dedication and the spirit of our university and the community 
that we were able to do the summit project in two weeks without a hitch. We had a lot of volunteers and it was just the community came together. It was a wonderful experience. Um, but what truly sets UMA apart is the commitment of fostering the sense of belonging. It's not uncommon for people from different sections of the university to stop by offering their assistance and financial aid or different opportunities in the uh, system. Um, the Dean of Students is taking the time to connect with us personally, joining us for a lunch and reinforcing the notion that every, vo every student's voice matters. And in closing, I want to express my deepest appreciation to the University of Maine and Augusta for providing me with the resources, the support and sense of community that have been instrumental in my academic journey. Uh, together, we have created an environment where every student, regardless of their background or circumstance, can thrive and succeed. And I'd also like to say what Jason said again, what the Veterans Center offers me to come back for that community and camaraderie has nothing that I've never experienced before. And I'm very grateful for that. So thank you all for, appreciate you. Hi everyone, my name is Holly Hunt and I'm a freshman in the UMA Aviation Program. I graduated high school last year from Monmouth Academy and I still live there in the small town of Monmouth. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and my experience with the UMA Early College Program uh, so that you get to see what it's like from a student's perspective and how that experience shaped the start of my undergraduate career. My journey with UMA Aviation all started with an email. The summer before my junior year of high school, UMA's early college program sent out an email explaining its aviation early college pathway and the specific classes I could take to further explore the field. At the time, I was interested in aviation, but I didn't really think I'd make a career out of it or if that was even possible for me. When I heard about UMA and their aviation program from that email, I figured that it would be the perfect chance to figure out if aviation was the way I should go. It wouldn't hurt and I'd get some college credit out of it. So my junior year, I took a couple of introductory to aviation classes, and I knew for sure that I wanted to be a pilot. And it worked out really nicely that UMA, only 30 minutes from where I live, could be the place I earned my pilot's license and degree. The summer before my senior year, Early College hosted a program for the students who took the junior year classes in the Aviation Pathway course sequence. During that program, we were introduced to our instructors and given the opportunity to fly UMA's brand new Cirrus airplane. When I flew it that summer, I truly was one of the first students to ever fly that plane. I cannot tell you how extremely lucky I was to be able to do that. It still had its new plane smell. It was that now. <laughs> but flying a brand new airplane was not the only benefit that came. <laughs> yes, it, it was awesome. But flying a brand new airplane was not the only benefit that came from that particular early college experience. I also met several UMA staff, each of whom were super encouraging. Knowing they're all there caring for me and ready to help is always a comfort. So after that summer in my senior year, I took an aviation weather class and the ground school required to get a pilot's license, again, through early college. Taking ground school in high school instead of in college pushed me forward so that the summer after my senior year, I could immediately start flight training for my license. At that point, I was a matriculated student at UMA. Early college had smoothly transitioned me from being a high schooler to being a full-fledged university student. What has made this entire process even more special is, again, the enormous amount of support I've received from my instructors and other faculty. Being a female in a hugely male-dominated career could seem daunting, but it's never felt that way because of those who have always had my back. Now, aviation was not the only part of my education early college helped out with. Starting my sophomore year of high school, I began taking concurrent and online classes through UMA, and I finished so many in high school that I've shaved off an entire year of college. Now I graduate in only three years. Having those online classes in high school also prepared me for the diverse class modalities I would encounter in college. This semester, I have every class modality there is, with some of my classes in person, some live online, and some asynchronous online, but I'm so used to that variety at this point that it's become normal. Another way early college helped ease the transition of becoming a college student was by giving me a solid foundation from which to build my university experience. I was already comfortable with the school when I started, so I was able to jump right into college life. I extended my days of being a student athlete by playing college basketball. I found a part-time job that I enjoy, and recently I've started participating in the UMA Aeronautical Society, a club made up of my fellow aviation students. Everything I've talked about thus far has only been possible through early college. 
Thank goodness for their original email. Otherwise, I may not have ever even heard about UMA's aviation program. Early college has been a crucial part of my journey with UMA, and my education would look drastically different without it. I'm truly thankful for all of the opportunities I've had through UMA's early college program, and I know that it has the power to transform many other high school students' college experiences as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody. So there's our students. Pretty impressive, huh? Um, <laughs> do we have time for a little panel or do we need to move uh, on? I think we said we need to move on. Yes. Okay. Thank and you look, very much. Anybody that has such a compelling question that. Thank you very much. That was phenomenal. Thank very, you. very terrific. And, and I, I understand it may not be true that there's a fundraising strategy at UMA. New college, new airplane cologne. Is that true? <laughs> Just checking. Just checking. Thank you very much. That was, I wish we did have time because all of you were so terrific. And there was, there are many questions, but unfortunately we are stretched kind of thin today. So thank you very, very much. Let me move us along um, to the president's round robin. Um, and I understand that, that, uh, President Rice, who was with us briefly, has a conflict. Again, we changed the meeting date, which was our problem. Um, and that President Softly, as you know, is participating in the accreditation visit. So um, Vice Chancellor Dorsey will give their reports, but we will, well, and we'll start with her because she's ready. <laughs> well, I am just now reading President Rice's and now I wonder if I really had why I agreed to do that, but <laughs> I'll start with President Softly's. Um, Lee starts with, uh, indicating she's sorry that she can't join us today, but as we just heard, she's in the middle of the 10 year annual sabbatical site visit for the accreditation of the main law building. I'm proud to say that, or she is proud to say that she has cleverly arranged for a partial eclipse of the sun to impress the team later this afternoon. <laughs> Last week in Washington DC, there was an annual conference of the International Association of Privacy Professionals that showcased many main uh, law alum and alumni and attending were also many uh, current Maine Law students. The conference was established by Trevor Hughes, now known internationally in the field of privacy law, who himself is a Maine Law graduate. In the International Privacy Law Moot Court competition held in Helsinki, Maine's law team won the award for best brief. Congrats to those amazing students and to Professor Scott Bloomberg, who along with Gabe Maldoff and Joe Jones coached that team. In addition, at the national moot court competitions, Maine Law's moot court teams have won awards for best brief in three competitions, advanced to the quarterfinals in two competitions, and advanced to the final round in one competition. She ends with, thank you for letting me brag about all these wonderful soon-to-be lawyers from afar. Now on to President Rice's update. His apologies for not being here this morning as he prepares for the totality of the eclipse up in Aroostook County. He wanted to thank everyone for not having him drive back on route, or he said route, I-95, so that it is, um, because it is likely a parking lot of out-of-state vehicles on the way to Umpy. He will note that one of the events happening today is the unveiling of the solarbration, <laughs> Q Lionel Richie in the background, I'm reading what's written, happening right now. Starting with our dedication of the new sun installation in front of Preble Hall at 10 a.m., so likely happening um, very soon. Distinguished guests include President Nancy Hensel, who set in motion, uh, along with Professor Kevin McCartney, a vision of the scale solar system model emanating from Umpy, where the sun was, down to Holton along Route 1 more than 20 years ago. It is really the jewel of the crown in North America's largest celestial scale, celestial scale model, and cannot emphasize how incredible it is that it is now completed, planning to fundraise around the installation all in under four months. We followed up with a dedication to the full-blown solarbration during the eclipse itself happening now, including music from faculty, staff, concession games, art projects, and visitors from all across the country at the campus today. They're especially pleased that they are expecting uh, the largest summer enrollments, a oh, quick transition to a new topic, uh, <laughs> summer enrollments in the history of the institution, driven greatly by the interest in the competency-based programming in which students have the opportunity to enroll in classes 365 days a year. 
They also have historically high applications and matriculations for the fall semester. Finally, even a total eclipse of the sun can't overshadow our excitement for commencement on May 4th. We are honored to have Kathy Pelletier serving as our commencement speaker. She will be addressing a class of over 500 graduates with over 200 marching in person, both historical highs for the institution. Most importantly, may the force fourth be with us this commencement. <laughs> It's a tough, it's a tough job, but you did it well. Yeah. <laughs> Let me switch over and ask President Freddie Monty to fill us in on you, Maine. It's going to be really dull in comparison. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have eclipse jokes, right? <laughs> we are sending a ninety a, a, a giant balloon ninety thousand feet up into the air from northern Maine today, though, with a humane group, part of the humane high altitude balloon ballooning program to um to take readings and photographs and to help part of uh, the documentation of the eclipse. Does but anyway, that have fresh balloons. Yeah. I'm sure it does. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. We just hope it comes down with yes. all of the instruments <laughs> intact, which I'm sure it will. Um, I wanted to just offer. Four very quick items under the general category of leadership and partnership. I think that um, there's just so much happening everywhere. I, I wanted to focus on some things that we are doing in collaboration with other universities and other groups. First, I'll mention the second main research symposium on biomedical science and engineering that was held recently. 250 folks came. It was hosted by the UMaine Institute of Medicine together with Jackson Labs, MDIBL, Maine Health and Northern Light, and the University of Southern Maine. And the topics in the conference uh, range from oncology to translational medicine to clinical research. This general focus on allied health, I think, is bringing out our strengths as a system in research and practice across these health-related fields. The second I, that I wanted to mention is our um, ongoing partnership with Tyler Tech, uh, which has been just a fantastic collaborator. One thing that they've been doing now for a couple of years is hiring buses that they are then filling with middle and high school students, bringing them to Orono for the day to uh, take a look, get a special tour, essentially. These are recruitment um, activities, but a special tour of the campus with a focus on STEM and computing. Uh, we've had uh, 135 students come through in five different tour days this year. They're a partner in many different levels, too. They sponsor um, an uh, they're now sponsoring a UMaine early college course in innovation jointly with us and um, offering scholarships and also, of course, building a new facility in Orono. So we see that as a kind of K through K through graduate education kind of partnership with a with a company. Packaging Corporation of America, another wonderful company, has made a one point six million dollar donation to the university to work on a sustainable packaging initiative. Just think about Amazon and all that packaging. Um, how can we imagine ways to uh, to bring some of the um, the science and engineering and technology that we have been developing at the university into that business? April is National Volunteer Month and Cooperative Extension has created an introductory volunteer management micro credential in partnership with Volunteer Maine. And we're hoping that that'll have a lot of uptake across the state. Um, finally, the Hudson Museum at the University of Maine has loaned works to two um, museums recently, the Farnsworth in Rockland. And what they've loaned there is a, a set of more than 50 Wabanaki baskets and tools as a part of an exhibit on Penobscot basketry. And then to the um, Portland Museum of Art, the work of Jeremy Frey, Jeremy Frey, uh, titled Woven. It's the first ever retrospective of a Wabanaki artist in a fine arts museum in the U.S. So we're very excited about being able to be a good partner. Great. Right. I didn't know you may had an Institute of Medicine. These are great. These are informative. Ron Robbins, President Edmondson. Thank you. Good morning. Do move this a little closer. Um, today, the uh, University of Southern Maine's planetarium is open for people to view the eclipse as well. And so we're really excited about people to have the opportunity to um, engage with the planetarium there. We have some really interesting student accomplishments right now. We have um, a student named Julia Gagnon. You may have heard of her. She is winning on American Idol, has an amazing voice. She's a USM history student. And what I know she's... She's fabulous, yeah. And what you may not know is that her mother, Meg Hauser, is the chair of our chemistry department. And so it's really a wonderful story and wonderful connection. We also recently hosted alumni jazz students, former students um, in a residency, and they did some performances in Portland. And also they had a small performance at Steve Polis's house in Falmouth. And it was just amazing to see the accomplished um, graduates of our jazz program. Uh, Governor Mills attended that event, which was really lovely as well. 
Um, in addition, we have students who are accomplishing in our esports world, which is totally a new area for me. But as you know, we've recently approved funding for an esports arena at the University of Southern Maine. And so I want to make sure you're updated on that. Um, but we had seven squads from the University of Southern Maine's Esports Club competing in post-seasons playoffs. They're competing in conferences that are nationwide. One is the National Esports Collegiate Conference and the Eastern Collegiate Athletic Conference. So who knew all of these things were happening, but it's really wonderful to see that club continue to grow. It's our fastest growing club and to see the level of engagement for students there. In addition, our men's and women's indoor track and field teams both won the LEC championships in February, and we recently had them over to the president's house to celebrate their accomplishments. It was a wonderful group of students. A number of them sat at the piano and played, which was also lovely to see too. So we have musicians throughout all of the life of the University of Southern Maine. And if you're in Gorham anytime soon, we are currently running um, a musical called The Prom. Um, it's a student production, and so you're welcome to, to join. I'm told that it's really terrific. We have um, launched a new website for the University of Southern Maine. We are seeing um, great attendance at our Admitted Students Day, so we're thrilled about that. And we're really also very proud of the accomplishments we're seeing through our degree completion program, which has been really sp um, supported in part um, largely from the chancellor, encouraging us to, to work in this space. Um, and so we're seeing um, a degree completion programs that are, are getting shaped up in nice ways. We have a new success coach who's hired and doing terrific work. And we have an adult student success center that's online. We were able to send people to a conference in Boston. And again, want to thank the chancellor for his support in that area. Thank you. Thank you. I got to go see eSports. Don't you think we should all have it? <laughs> President Dean. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to start with uh, the Fort Kent Outdoor Center hosted the U.S. National Biathlon Championships in March for 164 biathletes. And biathlon is a combination of cross-country skiing and rifle shooting. And in preparation for that event, in February, UMFK hosted an indoor biathlon competition. And uh, so we created a course throughout the gym. Uh, that that people would run and then they come into the area and we had laser rifles so they could shoot at the five targets. And if you miss a target, then you have to do a penalty lap. And so we, we were able to simulate the whole event. So in preparation for the national event, our community, as well as our campus employees and students were aware of how this event actually worked. Um, we had great participation. We plan to continue that event annually now as part of our winter carnival. Um, next, I'd like to share that during spring break, we had a group of students um, visit, they went on a trip to Boston and the students had to pay, they only paid $20 for their three day trip. Um, and it was sponsored by student affairs and student funds. And so that was a great opportunity for students for the first time leaving Fort Kent, international students, as well as local students to be able to travel to Boston. In March, we had our annual Sukari uh, event to celebrate the Acadian culture with food, music, and maple taffy. We had over 250 people attend that event, um, and it was a great day of celebration. Um, Patrick Lacroix, our director of the Acadian Archives, once again has hosted his um, online lecture series, 112 people participated in that event this year, the, the, the number of the um, presentations. So that was exciting to see. Um, we have we have um, entered into a partnership with Madawaska High School's LIFT program. It's a program for high school students with disabilities who receive services to the age of 22. And really the more natural environment for them, for them to be it would be on a university campus. So once a month, those students are joining us and partnering with our college students to do activities um, throughout the day and have lunch and spend time on our campus. And we look forward to continuing that, that process um, through next year. And then lastly, just Saturday night, we had our spring gala. Uh, the theme this year was denim and diamonds. And the just wanted to, again, thank the UMFK Foundation Board for putting on a spectacular event, well attended, and a very enjoyable evening. Thank you. Thank you. President McDonald. Good morning. Uh, we uh, had the ribbon cutting for our early childhood uh, center and education uh, center. We were joined by Governor Mills and Senator Collins. It is the perfect 
combination of supporting the community and providing a laboratory for our uh, students to learn hands-on with uh, these young students. The second thing I'd like to report on are the uh, two Libra scholars that we brought from our international partnership. One is a professor from Akita University with um, a background in mathematics and computer science. And he spoke about artificial intelligence and the uh, role that it uh, will play in bringing the liberal arts and sciences together. He actually thinks that uh, specialization and the creation of majors in the past, maybe, maybe not the future, that, that really it may be um, far more interdisciplinary in terms of what our uh, future looks like because learning specializations may not be what uh, students need, that what we have to do is prepare students to be flexible in a world that will change rapidly. And so the task of educators is to teach students to learn how to uh, learn and to arm them with things like creativity, uh, critical thinking, and interpersonal skills, which we say we do, but we do it um, not as consciously as we do the specializations. And so he's really seeking some kind of balance here. And it created a interesting discussion. There was a discussion just with the faculty. There was discussion with faculty and students. So we're, uh, you know, we're driving uh, this thinking about where AI will take us, but it will be in a very uh, different way than what we are, uh, what we're doing now. And I'm not sure we're quite prepared for it. The second group of uh, Libra scholars were musicians from conservatories in Italy, one from uh, Venice and one from uh, Pescara, which is on the Adriatic Sea. And they uh, were working with our students in the fall semester where we have this global exchange where a class uh, is uh, uh, working online together and the theme was uh, the environment and music. And they focused on water because water is an issue both for Maine, for Venice, of course, and for, for Pescata. And the, the students came, uh, the two faculty members and, and seven students came and they, uh, they performed. Uh, the, uh, the students had a wonderful uh, concert uh, and it was you know kind of spring-like when they uh, when they came, and unfortunately, they had prepared to uh, to perform Vivaldi's Winter. Uh, <laughs> they did that, uh, but the next day we had twenty inches of snow. So winter did return to to the spring. And, and one interesting thing, then the faculty performed. Uh, there was a um, a uh, uh, violinist and a uh, and, and someone at the piano, and they they performed. Uh, all uh, music, the composition based on water, very, very interesting. Uh, and their discussion of the way chamber music operates where there is no leader and you have to coordinate is really a lesson in democracy. So, uh, uh, and it, it really speaks to the uh, commitment that Farmington has to global experience. It's part of our DNA. Uh, finally, I would mention that our uh, ski team did extraordinarily well in the national competition in Lake Placid. We uh, uh, we did far better than what we had expected. And two of our students, one in free skiing and the other in snowboarding, actually won the nationals, which was extraordinary. And I think that this will uh, heighten uh, this university's tension in, in skiing and bring more uh, champions to us. So we're very pleased with that. Great, thank you. I know about the power of music, but I didn't know it was responsible for returning winter to us. <laughs> President Cushman. Yeah, I'm happy. 
I'm happy to have the opportunity to highlight some of the good news happening at University of Minnesota Augusta. First of all, um, I'd like to bring attention to our dental hygiene program at Bangor and Lewiston. On February 21st, the commission determined that the re recommendations cited in the site visit reported adopted August 10th have been met and adopted a resolution to change the program's accreditation status to approval without reporting requirements. So we're very happy about that. Also, our Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity program has been validated by NSA for University of Maine at Augusta through academic year 2029 and our application to be NSA CAE or Center of Academic Excellence Recognition is in its final stages. So we're happy about that too. And finally, we have been recognized nationally in a couple of areas. Um, first, we received two US News and World Report's top 100 best online program rankings in the categories of best online bachelor's program and best online bachelor's program for veterans. Our rankings improved in both of these categories, up 14 spots overall and up seven spots for veterans. Um, highly ranked programs have strong traditional academic foundations based on student instructor access, graduation rates, and instructor credentials, and ranked schools also excel at educating distance learners while offering robust career and financial support. Um, and then also, we uh, military-friendly schools just announced the, their official list of schools that have earned the 2024-2025 Military Friendly Schools Award level, and UMA again received gold level status. Out of 1,800 participating schools, UMA was one of just 243 chosen for the gold award status uh, for our leading practices, outcomes, and effective programs in supporting veterans and active duty military personnel. And you've heard some from some of our veterans um, who believe that as well. So thank you. Great, thank you, congratulations. Great, great. Always nice to have these upbeat moments. Terrific, thank you. Let me move us to, back to our agenda. Um, we have been talking about proposed, uh, Barbara Reed Alexander, Trustee Alexander has been chairing a committee to look at our policies and bring them up to date. You have seen them once before. This is the final um, review. So they have been vetted once. This is the final set of policies for your approval. In the interest of time, let me just ask if there are questions about the final draft. Seeing none, I'll go right to the resolution that the Board of Trustees approves the final version of the Editor Board Policies 202 through 206 as initially presented in red line form on January 2024 and provided at the April 2024 Board Meeting materials in final form. Could I have a motion? Moved by Trustee Alexander, seconded by Trustee Kane. All those in favor? All those opposed? Oh, Kelly, I think we, Trustee Martin, I think we need your verbal approval. I approve. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is approved. Yeah. Great. Um, the next item is our board and committee meeting calendar. We will not change our meeting again. We learned that conflicting with an eclipse was a really, really good learning experience. Um, but we would like to point out we are in the process of reviewing our meeting structure and schedule to think about ways that we can we know that we ask um, the universities to tighten their belt and we know that we should do the same. So we're looking at ways to both bring some cost savings and some more engagement in conversation in our meetings and, and to perhaps change uh, the rotation with which we go to campuses to save some money and burden on the campuses. All in the works to be reviewed by you, but the dates will stay the same. So today we're voting on the dates, recognizing that the, the place of the meetings may change. So any questions? With that, I'll go to the, the resolution that the Board of Trustees approves the Board of Trustees meeting calendar for 2025 and 2026 as presented. Can I have a motion? Second. Trustee Kane, seconded by Trustee Eames. All those in favor? Trustee? I'm also in favor. <laughs> Thank you. All those opposed? Great, okay, we're catching up. Um, let's move now to the Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs, and Jeff St. John is busy and away at an accreditation visit I'd be with Netchi, so we're pleased to welcome Jamie Ballinger. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me here today. My name is Jamie Ballinger, and I am the Director of Academic and Enrollment Initiatives for the University of Maine System. So I will do my best to fulfill the role that Jeff typically would be here for today. Um, I am here today to update the board on the direct admissions initiative. And I believe I have a PowerPoint that should be coming up here in just a moment. 
So the direct admissions initiative was launched almost a year ago today. Um, we have done a lot of great work in that time, and I'm very, very pleased to tell all of you that it is going exceptionally well. Do we have our PowerPoint? All right, well, I will do my best to wing it without a PowerPoint in front of me. So direct admissions, in a nutshell, turns the admissions process upside down. So what it does is instead of the students coming to us, we go directly to the students. Direct admissions is a way by which we work directly with high schools to, I'm getting a lot of shrugs from the front of the room. We work directly with high schools to gather information about high school graduating students. And those students, um, we admit to our seven universities based on their GPA alone. So just imagine this. We get a list of high school students and their GPAs, and we make our admissions decisions based on those GPAs alone. Direct admissions removes barriers to access for our students. So the primary barrier to access for many students, particularly our rural, our low income, our students of color, our students who might have been in an alternative educational setting, is the application itself. The application is anxiety riddled for students. As I'm sure any of our student reps can attest, it is an anxiety driven process. So direct admissions removes that anxiousness from students because they no longer have to apply at all. Instead, we go to them. So the student themselves never has to submit the Common App. They never have to submit a letter of recommendation. They never have to submit any supplemental materials or essays. In essence, we have removed as many barriers to the application process as possible. So last fall, we began a pilot program for direct admissions here in the state of Maine. And we did that because there has been tremendous success with these programs in other states. So in 2015, the state of Idaho, which is very similar to the state of Maine in many ways, um, it is rural, it is a relatively small population based off of its geography. It has a few population centers, but largely very disparate. Um, they were seeing a lot of the same issues that we were here in the state of Maine. So Idaho was seeing uh, an outmigration of students, and they were seeing a hmm, the number of rural low income students attending their universities was shrinking. So they got their heads together and came up with a plan, and they created and implemented the first direct admissions program in the state of Maine. Now that's almost a decade ago now, and so since then they have done lots and lots of research. They found that in the first two years of their program, they saw an 8% increase in students who were low income, students of color, students from rural populations coming to their universities. And they saw a significant increase in market share of students staying in the state. So this was a great idea. Minnesota started doing it, Wisconsin started doing it, Connecticut started doing it, New York has started a direct admissions program, Hawaii is starting a direct admissions program. We are on the cutting edge. There are only a few states who are doing it and all of the states are finding tremendous success. Lots of states are looking at it as well, but we are actually in our implementation phase. So last fall, we began it as a trial. We started it with our early college students here in the state of Maine. We know a lot about our early college students, and so we were able to um, gather information on them relatively quickly and easily. There were 3,000, well, 3,100 early college students who were graduating seniors last fall. Now, of those 3,100 early college students who were graduating, we sent out something like 14,000 letters of admission. What happened was we downloaded lists, we delivered those straight to our admissions offices, they considered every single student, and many if not most of those students were admitted to all seven of our universities. So it was a great trial for us. Now, here's where it gets amazing. Of those 3,100 students that we were trialing, 806 of them have come back and said, yes, 
I want to be involved in this. This is amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. Those 806 students went on to fill out a second kind of informational form gathering. You know, they're major, a couple of little tidbits of information. And those students were immediately entered into all of the communications that any admitted student would be. So all of those yield communications, invitations to open houses and accepted student days, and they started participating. And I'm very, very excited to say that as of, let me get my numbers from last night. As of last night, 257 of those students have confirmed to the University of Maine system. It's still early days. So 257 is very, very big deal. Um, we have students from that test from almost every high school in the state of Maine who have said, yes, I'm excited. Let me do this direct admissions initiative. We have students from schools like Presque Isle that every single early college student at Presque Isle High School have signed up and said, yes, I want to be part of this. We have students from schools that we don't typically get a lot of students coming from, Maine Math and Science, Scarborough, Camden Hills. They, we've seen an increase in the number of students who are interested in our university. And most importantly, these students, when they're saying, yes, I'm interested, they're saying, yes, I'm interested to more campuses. So they're saying, yes, I'm interested in UMaine, but let me also learn about Presque Isle and let me also learn about Fort Kent. And so it's raising awareness of some of our regional campuses that perhaps these students didn't know that those were options for them at all. Um, we have right now 16 homeschool students who have confirmed with us. These are students who don't have any engagement with colleges coming to sit at a table in their high school lobby. They don't have a school guidance counselor to help them navigate this process. And so this has created a pathway for them as well. Most importantly, in our phase one test with the early college students, 62% of them are underserved. So those are students who are low income, who are in a federally designated rural school district, who are students of color, or students who had that alternative educational pathway, like being homeschooled or attending a virtual academy. 62% of all of these students who are saying, yes, I want to be part of this, are underserved. So we are currently about to launch phase two of this program. This is expanding the program to high schools throughout the state. Phase one was just those early college students. Phase two is expanding it statewide. So right now we have selected a number of high schools across the state. We selected them because number one, they are sending a smaller percentage of their graduates to a University of Maine system school than they had historically. Number two, there are schools that we wanted to target in specific areas around the state. Or number three, there are schools that heard about it and said, I want in. We haven't turned anyone away who wanted to be part of this kind of test pilot. So of those schools, I have met with superintendents and school counselors and teachers and principals, and all of them are saying, I'm excited about this. This is the right thing to be doing right now. We need to go to students and meet them where they are. We need to remove these barriers. So thus far, we have had tremendous success with the Direct Admissions Initiative. We are hearing wonderful things from our partners across the state. The hope is to this fall work with that select group of high schools across the state, and then in the next cycle to expand it even further so that we have statewide coverage, hopefully at some point in the future. This is the future of admissions for our universities. So I've left out a lot of details and you didn't have the PowerPoint to refer to. So I would be happy to take any questions that the group has. Thank you. Oh, you do have the PowerPoint. Oh, excellent. All right. In the okay. materials. Thank Fantastic. you very much. Um, All right. Trustee any Kate. questions? Trustee Cates. Thank you. Your presentation. A question. I know that one of the things this program apparently depends on is getting the GPA information from the schools. How, how much success or or any obstacles you're facing in getting that from all the schools you want? You know what? Every single school has said to us, yes, I want to be part of this. And they I've heard the word no brainer 
several times because they recognize the benefit to their students. So it is a little bit of a challenge getting that GPA. It's FERPA protected information. So the students do have to have their parents uh, fill out a little form at the beginning of the school year saying, yes, I give my student permission to share their GPA information with the University of Maine system. But honestly, at the end of the day, it's relatively simple and I haven't seen as many problems with it as I expected. Other questions? Yes, Trustee Landry. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Is there a GPA? What's the GPA cutoff? I and mean, what's the... Each university has their own GPA cutoff. And so some have been exceptionally liberal, admitting pretty much every student who comes their way. And others have had, you know, a 2.25 is a pretty typical GPA cutoff. Um, but with the early college test population, every single student has to have a 3.0 to be part of early college. So all of those students were highly admissible to almost every institution. Thank you. Trustee McCarthy. Thank you, Jamie. I, I do agree. It's really important to remove barriers for students. So I appreciate all your hard work on this. And I know you've been championing it for a long time. I guess my question is, what, you know, what was expectations in terms of, uh, you know, outcomes here um, along the way? And then, um, you know, how, how do you, how do you think it might change going forward? Sure. So the test has blown my expectations out of the water. I was expecting, you know, a little trickle, maybe 15, 20 percent of students who received letters of admission to be interested. And it's been much, much higher than that, closer to 30, 35 percent. So that's phenomenal. We are also seeing about a 50 percent rate of those students who say, yes, I'm interested and fill out that quick form to go on to confirm their admission and matriculate. So the test group has been spectacular. Our expectations were based off of metrics set by Minnesota and Idaho, and those have been doing it for quite some time. In the future, as the culture here in the state of Maine changes and students in our public high schools start to expect their admission letters from our universities, um, I think that it, this will be the pathway that most of them take to be admitted. Why would you go through the effort of filling out the Common App and submitting recommendations and essays if you don't have to, if you're a 17 or 18 year old high school senior? Jamie, could I ask, of, of the 257 that you mentioned, you mentioned that they might be admitted to multiple universities. Right. Is that an unduplicated count? That is an unduplicated headcount of those who have confirmed today. So we had 809 unduplicated individuals who have said that, yes, I want to be part of the program. Of them, to date, 257 have confirmed. Okay. So we expect that number to go up significantly over the next few weeks. Of course, students don't have a lot of pressure to confirm before May 1st. <laughs> and do we have a way to, it, it's a fascinating program. Yeah. And I think we all very much appreciate the work to in, increase access, but do we have a way to track these students to see what they're, given that they don't go through the effort to think mm -hmm. about college and to fill out an application and all that painful stuff, do we have a way to track their retention rates to compare it to others who, who well we don't have our population quite yet to be able to do any kind of long-term tracking but that is part of the plan and that's right. the part that i find the most exciting i want to see how these students perform and persist on to graduation as they move through their education right trustee mcmahon actually my question was going to be based on the idaho and the other models what's the retention and what's the six-year graduation rate is there a marked difference between the early admit, direct mm -hmm. admit, and the students who come through the traditional route? That's a fantastic question. I'm glad you asked it. So they are starting to see, and every state is different, of course, they're seeing it basically at the same rate as students who have applied through the traditional model of filling out your common app, submitting all of your materials, and going through the anxiety-laden process. So the results are very similar among the two populations controlling for socioeconomic status. So students who are participating who are lower SES tend to not persist to graduation quite at the same rate as those who are higher SES. Any other questions? Great presentation, thank you very thank much. Thank you. And does anybody do I set up 10 or just me? There you go, 10. I've lost my place. Ah, tab four. 
Yeah, well, let's do, could we take a five minute break? Tenure is a big deal and we want to give it special attention, but let's let's take a five minute break um, and try to keep on schedule if we might.
As we are reconvening, I have an announcement from President Edmondson. It's a very important announcement about American Idol. Um, a certain US, as you know, a certain USM student is has made it through um, and we can vote for her. There's a, me there's a means to vote for her. The voting is closed for this round, but she's in the next one. And Jackie tells me you can vote 10 times a person. So here's how to do it. Write this down. <laughs> this is important. Text 21523. Text 21523. Hit message line four. And you can do it 10 times. So we want her to win. Can you give her name? Her name is Julia. And so keep an eye on um, when voting opens again, we'll do our best. <laughs> Message line. Okay. Yeah, you type it into, into your message, okay? Great. <laughs> we have to have a little lightheartedness. Um, let me move to tab four, the vote to approve University of Maine system 2024 tenure nominations. I wanna thank um, Vice Chancellor uh, for the hard work in doing all the the efforts to get to this. Jeff has done a great job. I want to thank uh, Chair David McMahon. The ASA committee takes this, this job seriously and looks at each of these proposals with rigor. Um, and I wish we could spend more time celebrating the importance of tenure and the achievement that our faculty has, has it, it, that we're recognizing today has achieved. Um, it's clearly not everybody makes it to tenure. It's the it's the coin of the realm, um, and with tenure comes a huge responsibility. Um, with the with the recognition that you are our um, recognized faculty comes the responsibility to serve the university, um, to help younger faculty, and to really do the work that's so important every day of of our faculty. So it's a it's a terrifically important moment for us, even though we only spend two minutes on it. So. Um, let me just read the resolution that the Board of Trustees accepts the recommendations for tenure submitted by the universities of the University of Maine system. Approvals will take effect September 1, 2024 for faculty with academic year appointments and on July 1, 2024 for faculty with fiscal year appointments. And there are 42 uh, among the system campuses in this, in this class. Can I have a motion? Oh. Moved by everybody. Moved by Trustee McMahon, seconded by Trustee Kane. And a comment from Trustee Gates. Thank you. I know all these 42 are incredibly um, accomplished and worthy of tenure. I just wanted to take a second to give a shout out to two of those people, uh, Patrick Cheek and Wendy St. Pierre, who are from here at the University of Maine at Augusta, who uh, Patrick Flood and I will fondly recall were members of the Presidential Search Committee that helped uh, bring Jennifer Cushman here. And um, they were incredibly helpful and, and valuable and, and played a big role in that. And so I just wanted to recognize the two of them. That's Thank great. You. And Patrick is here. Stand up, Patrick, when we... <laughs> mm -hmm. I think we forgot to vote though. <laughs> So that's probably important. We, we really have to make sure that we're real about this. Um, all those, we have the resolution, we have the moved and seconded. All those in favor? Trustee Martin? In, in favor. All those opposed? It's now official. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all of you. Let's move on to the Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives report. Except, oh, there she is, okay. <laughs> I noticed that we were right on time, so I wanted to make it quick up to the podium. Uh, as today's uh, VCSI report, I am pleased to announce that I have invited uh, USM President Jackie Edmondson, that she has agreed to offer a brief update on the exciting events at um, the Lewiston-Auburn campus. They have a lot of academic and collaborative initiatives underway, and I thought it would be a great time to have an update on that. So I'll turn the time over to President Edmondson, and then she can go from there. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you, board, for having this on your agenda. Just about a year ago, um, we were able to hire Dr. Nettie Provost to serve as the director for the Lewiston-Auburn campus. I've been so impressed with her leadership, her connections with the community, and the progress that's being made there. And so what I'd like to do is turn it over to Nettie to give you an update on the activities that are happening in Lewiston with our, our work, our collaborations there. So, Nettie, thank you. 
Thank you, President Edmondson, and good morning, everyone. Um, I would first like to walk you through some updates about our academic programs. Um, so we have three cornerstone academic USN programs at the University of Southern Maine Lewiston Auburn campus. <laughs> Um, the first of which is our Bachelor of Science in Nursing. That also exists in our Portland campus. We have cohorts in both locations, same faculty, same classes, same labs. We come to the students essentially in both of those locations. Um, I have 24 nursing students who will be graduating in May and they, majority of them have jobs already. So the workforce need for nursing is very high in the state of Maine and our graduates are by and large employed in their first choice jobs well before they graduate. And many of those job offers come from the robust clinical and practicum experiences that the students have. And as part of my work in the Lewiston Auburn campus, we have been expanding our clinical partnerships with St. Mary's Hospital and Central Maine Medical Center. And I'm delighted to say that um, several of my grads have jobs in those very hospitals where they did one of their clinical experiences. And I had one student who went to a info session about employment opportunities and had a job offer the next day from that hospital after she expressed interest in working at that location. Um, so our partnerships with these clinical agencies are incredibly powerful and staff who work in those agencies are also teaching for us. And so we have a wonderful partnership with a back and forth where students are gaining that real world experience from working healthcare professionals and then going on to employment in those very same locations. Um, we are also thrilled to just highlight that our students aren't just workforce eligible when they finish the program. Our students complete the right set of coursework and clinical experiences by partway through their junior year to qualify for a CNA in the state of Maine. So many of my nursing students who don't enter the program with a CNA claim their CNA, we help them do the paperwork, and then they're able to work as a CNA, gaining valuable experience and contributing to the workforce in the region and in Maine while completing their nursing degree. And that also then leads to more employment offers from the agencies that they're working in as CNAs. Our nursing program also has robust community partnerships because we strongly believe that healthcare is more than just the clinical experience in a hospital. We look at the holistic healthcare for all people in the state of Maine. So our nursing students work with area nonprofits, and this is throughout Maine, but to highlight some in Lewiston, Acadia Academy, which is a charter school just down the road from the campus, Lewiston Housing, low-income housing, and the Women's Wisdom, um, Women's Literacy Group in Lewiston, for example. Our students go to those organizations with a faculty member and spend a semester or sometimes a year identifying an unmet health need in the population of that organization and then implementing a project to address that unmet health need. So they're working directly with the community while learning at the same time. We also highlight our occupational therapy program, which I'm delighted to announce is growing. We have direct entry masters of occupational therapy. 24 students graduated last August from that program and our first ever doctoral student graduated in August of 2023 from that program. We currently have 54 students in the program at the master's level, 13 at the doctoral level, and 24 post-professional students who are doing advanced certificate degrees that completed their master's last year and chose to stay with the program to continue to expand their um, employment skills and knowledge. We also are launching in fall of 2024 the first um, cohort of the undergraduate occupational therapy degree. And that cohort will graduate beginning in 2028. They have to start as freshmen due to some uh, really intense accreditation body things that go into occupational therapy, but they will start admitting transfer students in the future. Um, and the OT program again highlights the community clinic focus of our campus. We have a full service occupational therapy community clinic on the campus serving members of the public. 
And this is free. We are partnering with many local organizations to refer patients to us. So our students, under the supervision of licensed occupational therapists, of course, are directly supporting individuals, largely right now children and adults with disabilities, although they do see some other clients, who can't afford or it will take too long to get them the access in the community for the services they need. So our students are able to provide those services for free to the community while while learning. Um, they'll be doing a car fit event where they are teaching people how to use a car, get in and out safely with mobility concerns coming up. So we also bring the community to the campus for educational opportunities where our students can teach as they themselves learn. Our third degree that I want to highlight is our social and behavioral sciences degree. Um, some folks wonder, what is that degree? It's a really incredible interdisciplinary major that highlights um, anthropology, sociology, psychology. And it looks at all of the aspects of what it is to be a group, what it is to be human, and rolls them into a dynamic degree with concentrations in public health and counseling. And it includes a really special option to get a mental health rehabilitation technician certification. I have to think through that one every time. And MHRCT, which is a license at the state level. I was just Googling today. Um, there's 101 jobs in Maine requesting that certification on Indeed right now. So it is another high in demand workforce area that our students can claim that certificate. They also um, have an incredibly robust internship program. So those students are out in the community throughout Maine, but especially in Androscoggin County, working in area nonprofits with different health organizations. So again, they're learning and serving simultaneously. Um, the other academic program I'd like to highlight is not technically mine, but I'm very, very fond of it. Um, it's our partnership with the University of Maine at Augusta. So the University of Maine Augusta is also um, has a satellite campus at our Lewiston Auburn location, and they particularly have a wonderful dental program there. They're doing dental assisting and dental hygiene. Dental assisting um, took me a minute to learn what it was. It's the stuff I don't like to think about, like putting fillings in and restorative services. And those students um, come from Bangor or from other locations to our state-of-the-art dental clinic, which if you're glancing at the PowerPoints um, is photographed up there. And this is a full service dental clinic where in the fall of 2023, over 50 appointments for the public took place for dental cleanings at this location. Again, free. Most of them were for young children for their first dental care and largely serving populations that have income disparities and do not have good access to dental care. Um, they are on track to do significantly more than those appointments this spring. And the dental assisting program is starting this spring and they'll do 30, at least 30 free restorative appointments for community members. And again, these are students working and learning simultaneously. Um, to highlight the other areas, we're revitalizing enrollment on the campus. This has been my favorite part of what I'm doing is out in the community, working to build strong relationships with our nonprofits, our healthcare agencies, our hospitals. And we are doing some great projects like hosting an adult ed class for college prep at the campus. So we've partnered with adult ed so that the college bound students coming out of our Daltad already feel at home at our campus, and they can realize and experience what it is to be at a college campus while they're finishing up that college prep adult ed program. We are also building a strong partnership with the Lewiston Regional Technical Center, which has high school students completing numerous health care and other um, credentials at the high school level, and we want to bring them into our majors. We'll be hosting over 40 sophomores on the campus coming up a little bit later this year. So we're working to get students thinking about USM and thinking about our LAC campus in particular very early on. 
And we're also partnering with the University of Maine Augusta for joint admissions events. So coming up towards the end of this month, we'll be hosting a joint admissions open house at the Lewiston Auburn campus to celebrate all of our programs. And our goal is that instead of having someone describe these degrees to you, this will be a participatory event where our students can come play in the labs. They can come know what it's like to be a dental student, know what it's like to be an OT student on campus, experience the mannequins and the simulation aspects in our nursing labs so that we can make the vision of what it is to be a college student very real to these individuals. Um, we also have an increase in our cultural and community events on campus. I'm delighted that our Lewiston Auburn Atrium Gallery, which has been a longstanding part of the community, is alive and thriving again. We began with our first exhibition in December of 2023, where a gentleman named Frederick came um, to do his first ever gallery show. And he is a survivor of Rwandan genocide who had both of his hands amputated in the jungle in Rwanda. And he taught himself to paint after the fact as part of his recovery. So Frederick, who lives in Portland, was able to come and do an amazing exhibition and some of his art is in the presentation where he spoke both about his process and about his own rehabilitation, providing educational opportunities for our students to learn about what it is to rehab in another country from grievous injuries and ask questions and learn from his experiences and experience the synergy between the arts and healthcare. Um, we also hosted the Celebrate People's Poster History um, with our Scontra Center for Labor and Community Events at USM. Over 200 labor history posters by individual artists were presented on campus. And we were delighted to unveil the first ever main poster in this national series celebrating the history of the J mill strikes. And we're able to have wonderful events and artist talks. And we had over 70 community members at the opening night, including many individuals who were part of the J mill strikes. We currently have our Franco-American Center being highlighted. They're calling it their 50 plus anniversary. Um, the 50th got derailed during COVID. So it's the 50 plus celebration right now. And our Franco-American collection is housed at the Lewiston Auburn campus, and they are preserving and promoting the culture and heritage of Maine's Franco-American populations. Today is tech, this year is technically their 52nd, but we're calling it the 50th um, anniversary. This center is integrated into our classes. We have high school classes utilizing the center. There are some scholarships through the center for folks to bring high school students and integrate their learning from the collection. Um, they do public outreach, educational opportunities and have an extensive digital and physical collection. The collaborations between Lewiston Auburn um, and the main Franco-American organization, different thing in the community, there's a lot of things with the Franco-American title in Lewiston. Um, are really robust, and we recently were able to collaborate with Bates on a um, one-day concert where USM faculty member Melinda Hasselet was able to present, and we had folks from Canada and from out of state at that event celebrating music and Franco-American heritage. Um, lastly, I want to highlight our community events and the fact that we're also renting out spaces where a conference center and we do internal and external USM and UMS events. And we have organizations from all over the state utilizing our spaces. Some of them are, for instance, O'Reilly Auto Parts there once a month for their meetings. But many of our events are academic and opportunities for our students to learn. For instance, on the 20th, coming up on Saturday, we're hosting for the first time the main occupational therapy organizations annual conference at the campus. This is an amazing opportunity to bring the conference to our students because for students, getting to a conference can be tough. It's the travel, it's the logistics. For our occupational therapy program, the conference is coming to them and we are delighted that they will be able to participate in that learning opportunity along with their faculty members and be involved in their national and local organization. Um, 
we as a campus are up over 50% on events from this time a year ago. So month to month, we're up over 50% in the last year. Part of the goal of this is also to raise the profile of the campus in the community and make sure that we're on the radar of community members and future students. Um, so it serves both a purpose of being a point of contact for the community and these events are essentially additional recruitment opportunities for us. So with that all being said, um, I want to thank you all for letting me talk a little bit about our Lewiston Auburn campus today. And um, if you are interested in keeping up with what we're doing, we're USM LAC on Instagram and we post all of our events and workshops there. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. Comments, questions? Oh. <laughs> it's it's particularly wonderful for this board to see that the LA campus is really taking on such a lively role. It's terrific. Yes. Questions? Huh? I have one. Could I when I was lucky enough to be there and get the yeah. tour, I was struck by the you know, obviously Lewis and Auburn's a growth community, population growth. Mm -hmm. And I was struck by the number of new mainers I met. Yes. Do you have a sense of how how big a portion of your um, students are from uh, New Mainers? Um, I have the data on the number of students from Androscoggin County, but not broken down as New Mainers right now. Um, we did just host, though, um, a wonderful data report unveiling um, workforce and educational needs in Androscoggin County, where our Career and Employment Hub and our Intercultural Diversity Office partnered with the um, Immigration Council and was the first higher education institution to be awarded the Gateways for Growth Award, which created a data research um, report on Androscoggin County and immigrants and their education and workforce needs. Um, I think three of the five top jobs that were highlighted in that report were healthcare, um, which is the current theme of our campus. Um, so that placed us well to support that population. Great, anybody comments, questions? Terrific, thank you. Thank you. Um, are you gonna do it later? Okay. Vice Chancellor Dorsey on the labor relations. So before you today, you have a tentative agreement with the um, police union, and it relates to Maine PERS, which is the Maine Public Employees Retirement System. And they have entered into a tentative agreement that allows uh, the members of that union to be able to uh, purchase service credits at their own expense. And that way, therefore, it could count towards the service credits they have towards their retirement benefit. It's been agreed upon with the union and our bargaining team, and it is before you for approval. Any questions before I read the resolution? Seeing none, that the UMS Board of Trustees accepts the recommendation of the Human Resources and Labor Relations Committee and agrees to allow the purchase of prior service. Prior service is defined as service to the UMS prior to July 1, 2022. The Board of Trustees agrees to the following terms. A, to allow its eligible police union members who elected to join Maine PERS to purchase credit for service to UMS prior to July 1, 2022 upon the employee's full payment of all associated costs. UMS will not participate in the purchase of prior service. And so employees who wish to purchase prior service are responsible for paying the full liability associated with it. And B, to authorize the UMS Chancellor Daniel, Daniel Malloy to sign the amended agreement between the UMS and the main PERS. Can I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Eames, seconded by Trustee Kane. Any further comment? All those in favor? Trustee Martin? I'm also in favor. Anybody opposed? The motion passes. Great, thanks. And let's now turn to research and innovation with Vice Chancellor Farini Mundi. Good morning, everybody. Um, We'll jump right in. I'd like to ask you to imagine a slide that I have used uh, other times, but it's a cycle and it has basic research, exper experimental development and innovation and wider use as the sort of circle around the side. So basic, experimental development, innovation and wider use. And then across the middle, it has talent and economy. And um, I've used this in different ways, but today I'd like to use the basic idea to try to 
bring to light some of the exciting work going on across the system that um, I think gives evidence to the fact that we really have a, an amazing ecosystem that is situated within that cycle and with that talent and economy focus, not only within the system, but for the state of Maine and beyond. And so we have today with us just this morning, uh, three examples of that work as it goes together. And you'll hear the focus on particularly on experimental development, uh, on talent development, and then the innovation into wider use and how we work together to do that. Before we jump to um, our wonderful group of presenters, I just would like to also acknowledge uh, that you've seen the announcements of the extraordinarily um, wonderful projects uh, and great um, great funding at $56.5 million coming in in congressionally directed spending um, for fiscal year 24. Special thanks, of course, to Senator Collins and her leadership role as the vice chair of the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee, as well as to Senators King and Representatives Golden and um, Pingree and to Sam Warren for her tremendous leadership in making this happen. Uh, this is a set of projects that also situates itself within that framework that I spoke about. It's about doing uh, all kinds of basic work, experimental work and innovation work that's driving the talent and economy for the state of Maine. And I would like, because we're at Augusta, to single out the fact that University of Maine at Augusta is receiving $4.5 million to renovate and relocate their nursing program. Um, and then expand enrollment and their output of healthcare professionals. So particular congratulations to you, Maine Augusta, for that, uh, for that good work. I'll turn now to the actual uh, panelists who are going to speak with us today and um, go relatively quickly, but we'll hear from three individuals who are a part of that ecosystem and they'll illustrate with their remarks briefly how it is that we are advancing talent and economy for the state of Maine. And we will start with Wendy St. Pierre, who I think came in. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Wendy from She was congratulated over a so we should give you another. Oh, yay. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. So I'm Dr. Wendy St. Pierre. I am an assistant professor here at Mental Health in mental health and human services. And I'm also the academic coordinator for that program. I'm here on this panel talking about a grant that we received in collaboration with University of Maine at Augusta and University of Maine at Farmington. So a group of faculty from UMA and UMF came together in the spring of 2022 to apply for one of the University of Maine systems, talent research and innovation for Maine grants. That grant was funded by the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan, and that plan is Governor Mills' plan approved by the legislature to utilize Maine share of the federal pandemic relief funds provided by Congress. Those funds came to the University of Maine system for workforce development and were awarded for this project by the Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation. So the two programs that came together to apply for this grant and since have received that grant is my program, University of Maine at Augusta's Mental Health and Human Services degree program and University of Maine at Farmington's Rehabilitation and Human Services program. There are currently four faculty members, two from UMA, two from UMF, who are working collaboratively on this project, as well as we've been able to use grant funds to hire an undergraduate research assistant. So our grant application focused on reducing student barriers to entering two crucial workforce areas here in Maine. One is to become substance use treatment disorder counselors, and the other is to become employment specialists. So we focused on the barriers, including student tuition. When we talk with students about what are your challenges for coming into the field of human services, the cost of tuition is one of them. So roughly half of our grant budget is focused on student tuition waivers. We are offering students, if they come into one of those two pathways, we are covering 50% of their tuition towards those courses. We also are looking at promoting and getting information out into the community about these crucial workforce areas, including going to conferences and um, various community activities to promote both programs, as well as entering human resources on a broader level. 
and we are supporting students and encouraging them to pursue getting licensed as substance use counselors and licensing has costs associated with it. And we have some funds set aside to help cover the costs of licensing for students who successfully pass the exam, as well as increasing accessibility to study guides, which also are a significant expense for students. So the two pathways that we're supporting the first one I'm gonna talk about is becoming an employment specialist. So the curriculum for employment specialist is housed at University of Maine at Farmington, was created by my colleague, Dr. Nicole Achi, who is an assistant professor there. And she has created a curriculum that meets the national criteria. So students who graduate with this two class, six credit curriculum can become a national certified employment specialist. They work with individuals with disabilities to enter or re-enter the workforce. And so they're hired by vocational rehabilitation programs and other organizations. Here in Maine, individuals who have one or more disabilities are in the workforce only about 38% of the time. So we have an opportunity to encourage individuals to consider entering the workforce to meet some workforce needs. Um, as of right now, the Employment Specialist Program has funded 17 students to take one of the two classes in that curriculum. We have additional funds to support through students through summer and fall. The second pathway is housed here at UMA, and it is the Substance Abuse Rehabilitation Technician in the Community, uh, Technician um, Undergraduate Certificate. A bit of a mouthful. We use the abbreviation SART for ease for ourselves and our students. So that is a 10 class um, curriculum available all online for student maximum accessibility. When they complete those 10 classes, they can pursue becoming licensed substance use counselors here in Maine. As of right now, we've used the grant to support 25 different students in that pathway. We've funded a total of 52 classes, 156 credits, and many of these students are only part way through that 10 class sequence. So we will be continuing to fund them through summer and fall with the hope that we can continue to increase the students entering that pathway and finishing up with that certification. So some milestones we've achieved right now include we have 43 students who've been directly impacted through tuition help from the grant. We have over 150 students who have been impacted by the grant since we've had a lot more students apply and have received individual one-on-one -on -one academic advising about whether or not the grant makes sense, how do we help them focus on completing their degree in the shortest amount of time. So really have seen these additional benefits to these grant um, applications. Applications. We also are increasing the amount of classes between UMA and UMF that are cross-linked. So to make it easier for UMA students to take classes at UMF and the UMF students to take classes at UMA. So working on that process. And we also have um, used these resources to receive institutional review board approval. So an IRB approval at both institutions. So we actually can now conduct a research study to assess the impacts on these students, on their academic achievement, as well as their professional development. I wanna finish this with a um, brief story about one of the students currently receiving the grant. So she gave my permission to share a snippet about her story. So she is a 53-year-old non-traditional student who lives in Belfast, Maine, and receives support from the university, from UMA's Rockland Center. She chose to enroll in the Substance Abuse Rehabilitation Technician Certificate here at UMA because she is the mother of two sons. Her 21-year-old son was involved in the drug world and was killed by gun violence in 2021. Three months later, her older son died of a fentanyl overdose. She felt called to become a substance use counselor, but had financial barriers that were impacting her ability to complete this training. Access to the grant has helped her be able to complete her classes. She's actually graduating with her certificate at the end of this semester. And she is looking forward to using that certificate to enter the workforce. And she said to me, 
I hope that I now have a vision for the future of something I can do based on what happened to me. And if I can spare one other mother, one other family from having what happened to me happen to them, then this endeavor was a success. Any questions for me about what we're trying to do and who we're impacting? I mean, a lot of the students here at UMA who are in this program are students in recovery, are students who have their own personal experiences that brought them here to help and serve others. So for us, we feel very motivated to help address these larger issues going on here in Maine. Great, thank you. Any, any questions? If not, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And, you know, as we hear this incredible story, I'm struck by what we're able to do in Maine that might be harder in a different kind of place, which is move all the way from the very, very challenging issues that our students face and the story that we just heard to um, engaging in programs with state funding that are both research based, all of those national credentials and so forth need to be right at the cutting edge, but our research generating, she, she did that very quickly, but we're going to learn from this implementation and that's key as we try to grow that cycle. I'll make the next two introductions all at once so that we can go quickly, but uh, next we'll hear from Colleen Walker from the University of Maine. She's director of an organization called the Process Development Center, and she'll talk about inspiring future Maine scientists. This is very much in the experimental development and talent piece. Following her will be Jake Ward, who is um, the vice president for SPIRE at the University of Maine. He'll talk about an internship program that works across the entire state with companies to uh, place students in our workforce. And not with us today, um, but we will bring him to see you at another time, I hope, is Scott Kleiman, who works um, as the Policy Director for Economy and the Workforce in the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future. And Scott, and maybe Jake will say a bit about it, was going to talk about the fact that Maine has been designated um, as a regional tech hub by the EDA, and what does that mean for our state and our system, and how can we be engaged? So all pieces of that system, but I'll go to Colleen. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm Dr. Colleen Walker. I'm as uh, president from Mundy Mon said, I'm director of the Process Development Center. It's a 30,000 square foot facility on the campus in Orono. Uh, for about 35 years, we have been fulfilling the service mission of the university by working with industrial clients. Uh, we have a wide variety of capabilities, a pilot paper machine, pilot coders. I'm here, to, uh, it's my, I've only been there for six years, but it's my pleasure to talk about an innovation that came about 10 years ago. Um, and I like to call it sort of a platform innovation because it's launched many, many other innovations. And it all is around this material called cellulose nanofiber. I'm not sure if any of you've heard about it. I'm gonna start passing samples around, but the, I have more of these little jars if you wanna see it, just to point out the solution. Um, this is made from nature. We're really leveraging what nature has already built into the tree. We make this material from a standard market pulp that you would use to make a, a premium tissue or towel. Um, we use a mechanical refiners, which can be found in any paper mill in the world, a very common piece of equipment. So we fibrillate, which is kind of like unwinding nature's natural fiber. Um, and we make this material, uh, it's 3% solid. So it's 97% water. All right, so it doesn't even fall out. I encourage you to take a look at it. The kids call it mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> And we've launched a lot of different innovations. I'm going to pass these around so you can take a look at some of them. This is the Josh, you're welcome to take this. You can freeze dry that material and you can make something like this. When you'll see you and touch it, you can feel it's just like styrofoam. <laughs> Any um, so with this material, we've been working with researchers on campus. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's a great innovation because it's a platform innovation. I like that it launches so many different other applications. And the other one of those um, unplanned for discoveries is that really gets kids uh, interested as well. And I'll tell, bit, tell you a bit more about that. This is another application with another one of our scientists on campus. They take the cellulose nanofiber and they can blend it with wood flour and make particle board. So there's, it's from out of formaldehyde-free particle made from that same 
Uh, and then we've also have some research advancing as well where we can 3D print with it. So this is that same cellulose nanofiber. It's been slightly modified and then mixed with a P PLA, polylactic acid, and then you can 3D print with that. I don't have some of the other great examples I don't have with me. You can use the same material, blend it with other, other components and make a replacement for bone. So instead of putting a metal oh. piece into your body uh, that you would later for support that you would later have to remove, you can use the same cellulose nanofiber, uh, put, put the structure in your body and then it's, your body will just simulate it over time because cellulose, if you go back to your high school chemistry, is just a bunch of glucoses lined up. So your body is, is very biocompatible and it can um, work very well in that way. Another set of its great properties are oil and grease resistance. You can take this material, coat it on a sheet of, of regular paper and it's like laying a piece of plastic on top. It can keep the oil out, it can keep the grease out and has a great oxygen barrier. So researchers on campus have been looking at it as a replacement for PFAS. We all know the issues around PFAS. Um, and so we have researchers looking at that in food applications. And I think the final one I'll talk about for applications uh, kind of blows my mind is you can use this material to put out fires. Believe it or not, you can use wood to put out a fire. So we have a researcher on campus is that developing that technology He's working with our local fire department um, to spray this material on fires. Um, it'll put it out and the firefighters like it because it won't reignite. So we're working on advancing those uh, applications as well. But as I mentioned, I like this, this innovation because it's launched all those great innovations that I've talked about, all those different uses. When teachers hear about this material in the K-12 sectors, they get really, really excited. Um, because of they, they love all the different things that they, it can do. They love that it is made sustainably from, from trees. Um, and then they can have their students work with this material. It's very safe. Artists in the state have also gotten very interested in this material for the same reason, because the, there are no harmful uh, solvents or other materials in it. So kids like to play with this. You can add color to it. It takes color very well. I pass this around. It's just an interesting piece of art, but feel the texture of what this, it feels like plastic, but it's just wood with color. Hmm. As I mentioned, we have lots of um, teachers that are interested in introducing this material into their classrooms, and they have been doing that. We've been working with all the schools in Maine, but a good thing, the word spreads. We're working with schools in West uh, Virginia, uh, Tennessee, and um, Ohio, and well as also in uh, one of my favorites is in Dover, uh, New Hampshire, where their principal at a, a middle school has said incorporating the cellulose nanofiber into their curriculum will really make their school stand out. Uh, the, the, again, I said, like I said, the teachers love to see this material. It really encourages kids that are looking for sustainable solutions. We all know how youth is very concerned with the big plastic uh, garbage mat out in the ocean, that they're looking for these new sustainable options. So this material we like because it can transcend proficiencies. It works very well in a classroom where you have AP students or also where you have students that are maybe more interested in art or even uh, one of our teachers is using it with children that have learning disabilities. So uh, I'm just very pleased to work on this uh, the topic. We're also doing a lot to help our local companies in Maine. We work with uh, Timber HP, Tambark Mold of Fiber, uh, maybe some other companies that you know, Sappy, on developing this material for their products. So we're really uh, very happy to support this and, and excite our youth to pursue careers in the forest products industry. So thank you. Great. Thank you. We don't often get show and tell. Thank you. Uh, it's fun. It's always it fun, fun to have samples to show people. Colleen, can you, the, the reference to, you, was, you covered so much territory yes, so well. The reference to bone, is that actually happening? Is that? It's, it's been technology, and Jake probably can answer more to that than I can. But yes, we have that, that technology is moving forward. Amazing. Questions for Colleen? Great. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Good morning, and again, Jake Ward, Vice President of Spire, University of Maine. Great act to follow. Colleen's one of our stars. Um, I am going to just do a real quick uh, transition to uh, the Tech Hub designation that uh, President Freeman mentioned. Uh, Scott Kleiman from GoPIF was going to be here. Uh, but it's a perfect segue because what everything you just heard from Colleen is really what makes us a nationally recognized leader in forest bioproducts. So in our application last year, we applied to the state of Maine to be a um, 
one of the EDA's designated tech hubs for forest bioproducts advanced manufacturing. And so we won that designation last October. So we can wave that around all the time. But it also gave us a chance to apply for another grant, phase two grant, which is a $75 million, 10-year 10, 10 project, 65 from the federal government, to really focus on accelerating the commercialization of everything you just saw in the forest bioproducts, whether it's the nanocellulose and those applications, the 3D printing, building materials, biofuels. One of the big challenges in, in the country right now is recognizing that there are opportunities to use forest biomaterials, other ag materials, to get rid of plastics where you don't need single-use plastics, other chemicals, PFAS, things like that. And companies are aggressively looking for those alternatives, but taking that lab sample that Colleen has in her hand and turning it into a production plant is a much bigger step. And so the tech hub opportunity, it's not R&D, it really is focused on commercialization, industrialization, and really focused on working with companies and partners. It capitalizes on our partnership with the Department of Energy and Oak Ridge National Lab, the U.S. Forest Products Lab in Wisconsin. Those are all partnerships that we already have where we're developing these technologies and putting them into place. But now we need that industrialization, scaling. There's sales and marketing, looking at applications for substitutions. There's all the quality control testing, uh, life cycle analysis. It's really Europe is doing this right now, and we're, we're playing a little bit of catch up. Part of the Tech Hub designation is to be a U.S. leader for for national competitiveness. In some cases, say national security. I'm not sure fiber reinforced toilet paper is national security, but some of you may think that it's different. But <laughs> anyways, uh, that's a pending proposal led by the state, Maine Technology Institute, University of Maine, RU, Maine Community College System, uh, Department of Labor, Department of Economic Community Development, Maine Technology Institute, if I didn't say that already. Many, many companies are leaning in on this. Um, and it is it is technology. It is innovation and entrepreneurship, a big program to get more companies started working with the RU. It is labor, workforce, apprenticeships, working with Maine Department of Labor, Maine Community College System, CTEs, and it is market development uh, across the country. So we're very excited to be designated and we're gonna continue to play that role as a designation uh, working on the pending funding. Um, a lot of this started a few years ago with Build Back Better. We didn't get the Build Back Better, but we have subsequently gotten a lot of funding on the R&D side, commercialization side, through other programs. As Joan mentioned, uh, the Senator Collins and the delegation were very helpful in us getting funding, including $10 million to do an expansion on the PDC, uh, additional funding to do 3D printing homes, things like that, that have really boosted our capacity uh, to work in that space. So that's that's my pitch on Tech Hub. Happy to take any questions. But what I really wanted to talk about was our Innovate for Maine um, uh, internship program, and this ties right along with the talent development. We've doing, been doing it for about ten years now. Innovate for Maine fellowships are summer internships. Companies apply, students apply, and they have to have an innovation oriented project. This is not going to. Uh, just do day-to-day -day office work or running a production line. It is really to focus on innovation. And um, part of it is really focus on startups. We have different grant funding that we subsidize it for. If you're a big company, can afford it, you pay for the whole internship. If not, we subsidize it based on the size and scale of your company. This last two rounds, we have main jobs, uh, MEJERP. We get, forget what the acronym stands for anymore, but to fund some of those. And so we've been doing it for about 10 years in, in really important aspect of it is it's a cohort model. So um, we'll run the students together. They actually are employees of the University of Maine. So it makes it easy for companies to take them. We have a mentor for them. We do coaching sessions. We build them into teams. We bring the companies together. So while many companies are doing their own individual projects, the, the students are learning as a team. This year, uh, this summer, we'll have a cohort in Portland, a cohort in Orono, maybe some in Brunswick. We've had them some in Waterville, um, but we try to partner with an organization where we can keep them together. So in the history now, we've had, uh, oh, and it's available to any college kid in Maine. So it uh, doesn't matter what school you go to in Maine, if you're a Maine resident, and if you are not a Maine resident and you go to school in Maine, you can. So we have uh, had 50 universities represented, 250 different companies, 300 plus students, 20% of the alumni have gone on to start their own companies. Uh, for this summer, we have 150 student applications, 29 colleges and universities, including the Uni University of Maine system campuses, 
and then 80 company applications. So we're hoping to place at least 60 students with our remaining major funding and then uh, uh, other sources, uh, specific grants or the companies pay their full vote. So um, in, in connected to the tech hub, we've put um, these interns into some of the startups that are working on these companies. Uh, one that's been in the news a lot lately is Tanbark. So that's another molded fiber startup company in Saco. And we've got interns working with them. Uh, often the companies will um, then go on to hire some of these students. So that's my quick and dirty for the whole thing and happy to take any questions. Oh, and bone. So we do have fake bone going. We are doing some animal trials. You, you use it to see if uh, uh, how tissue will grow into it and then whether it um, has any uh, rejection effects. And what is happening is that this material is, is basically bio, what do they call it? Calling bio neutral or bio invisible or something like that. So anyways, good stuff. That's amazing. Biocompatible, there we go. Oh, that, that would be helpful for bone. Yeah. Good questions. Trustee Alexander. Fascinating, fascinating set of um, uh, reports and updates uh, for those of us on the board. What is the process by which the university system as a whole is involved in the um, opportunities uh, to participate um, in the programs that you described? So on the internship program, uh, our team goes and meets out with all the individual campuses and tries to recruit students to apply for those. So that's happening on a regular basis, been happening every year for 10 years. Um, the uh, As far as the Tech Hub designation and that activity, uh, once we get it, but any of the R&D stuff. So we do have some other course products related partnerships. We're doing the um, Industry 4.0, industrial engineering, uh, building some connections with the community college and USM. Uh, there's a couple proposals pending right now that brings UMA into our advanced structures composite mini gem, gem and green engineering materials. So it's in some cases, case by case. Jason Charlin, our director of office of research development has been uh, doing incredible activity, reaching out to individual campuses to see where their projects, their alignments uh, can partner with us. Yeah, I, I would think that would be a really important part of your work as you scale up. Yeah. I mean, the initial stages, of course, yeah. need uh, more focused attention. But thank you very much. Sure thing. Anyone else? Trustee McCarthy, you're not off the hook. Jake, yet, Jake. Jake you can't leave yet. Um, well, I, I know you've been doing a lot of work for years, like creating the conditions for innovation on campus, which has been really important. And, and we were a proud recipient of innovative, Innovate for Maine uh, fellow at MedRhythms in the early days, which is really right. helpful for us. Um, I know research expenditure has gone up three or four X, which is really exciting because it's sort of like a leading indicator for new things coming out for the economy and helping out the state. So to in this new environment, right? Like what, what are you seeing as opportunities or challenges for bringing innovative things to market? Yeah, um, I think the, the, the still, uh, the challenge of as one thing that we've done great is invest in the R&D and infrastructure. So we have a lot more capacity, um, but that also means that that capacity is solving federal programs. So when you bring a company in, you're standing beside 30 federal programs instead of 10. So we're, we're seeing a, yeah capacity, uh, bandwidth scheduling type of thing. We're, we're working through it. Um, the other thing is that nationally and internationally, some of these things like the green economy, blue economy are a little bit different model than in the industrial economy than what's been in the past, right? So that's why I say really focusing on that industrialization and supply chain are important components to some of these activities where, um, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, they've got a, a, a pill manufacturing facility, it's just what's the next drug that goes into it, right? And I don't mean to diminish that, that's all really important, but it's a different model than what some of the things. So I, I think still talent, talent that understands market, talent understands unbridled commitment to work 24 hours a day to bring something through. And that that talent needs to be in companies, it needs to be in investors and it needs to be in the university. Yeah. Right. Yep. Trustee Misha. Thank you very much, Jake. I know you guys are doing an excellent job there, your team. So I really appreciate it. Uh, my question is similar to what Owen had mentioned. What, what, when you look at the research that's out there and you look at some of the problems Maine's facing, I'm thinking in terms of uh, wood uh, with the upgrade and a lot of the rail system, there's a lot of those old railroad ties that have creosol in them. Some do, some don't. 
what are you are you doing anything uh, as it relates to that how you take care of that waste number one and number two how do we make better railroad ties of a composite that will last longer and not cause environmental problem um i haven't haven't heard that one for a while but the, we did have a, a little bit of a run of work on that uh in the um like 2010 through 13 that was when some of the rail lines were transitioning uh that's a tough problem to solve uh because um, they do make composite railroad ties. They do make alternative material ties. It's a it's a it's an economic opportunity. Creosote soaked wood ties are so inexpensive that it's trying to get a technology that will replace and getting companies that are committed in the commodity space to think about a longer life cycle, less environmental contamination, things like that than what they've done. Same old, same old. So I know we have a solution for it technically. I don't know that we have a solution that's uh, economically uh, viable to to those companies yet. It's similar as what we're seeing in the um, coastal activity right now with all the extreme events, traditional uh, wooden and other types of materials are washing away and not serving. There's, there's technology solutions that are better performing. They're just not at that scale of economic opportunity yet. And it's a, it's a market driven thing, but there's a lot of work going on there. Trustee Cates. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Jake, as always. Um, my question is about, about long-term financial viability here of these funding sources. It seems like a lot of this money has come through because of the pandemic, money from the federal government, money from the federal government that went to the state that is now going to these projects. What, what, what are you sensing about continued um, funding opportunities for the kinds of exciting things you're talking about. Beyond. Yeah. So I think uh, on the internship program, we were funding that largely through uh, there was company funds and things like that. So the more recent dollars has allowed us to grow and expand the program. So creating the values, it's a, really about a value proposition. If you're going to have the private sector pay for it, they got to feel like they're getting something. And the internships, I think they most definitely do. I think that's going to continue to grow and expand that way. And, and really, there's a lot of internships. A lot of companies have internships. They just haven't crafted them in this way. So in some ways, um, up, upscaling or upgrading existing is going to be a way to sustain it um, in, the, in sort of the research side. Um, so yes, some of it, it's, it's, it's largely federal government. It's going to be federal government nationally, internationally. Private sector funding research has only been about 6% total overall. Um, and so it's it's if you look at the history, it's what programs in the federal government have changed and how they've changed. So, um, yes, the pandemic and some of this ARP money has is an opportunity. The, the, the nice thing is that in many of it, it's going into infrastructure. So upgrading, replacing infrastructure that's going to last 10, 20 years is is really the value that we see now. Um, but I mean, it's. Um, it's, it is going to be a dependent on that, and we need to be wise about not getting too big too quick uh, so we do have sustainability. Trustee McMahon. If you get this uh, EDA grant, well, they have cells. Is there any opportunity to make venture capital? Yeah, there's a. There's a you can get venture capital coming from Maine, so it would be definitely setting up the Silicon Valley. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's actually, it's almost written just like that, nanocellulose valley instead of Silicon Valley. Uh, but, uh, and this has been a, a largely an initiative with Rue um, building out on their investment connections, other place, is to bring a cohort of venture capital into the tech hub and have them be at least sitting there willing to look. They're not necessarily committing to making a fund yet, but that's a, that's a goal. And there's four or five of those organizations that are part of that. Other questions? Jake, thank you. It's sure fascinating. Thing. Great. Okay. So I'll just wrap up briefly and thank uh, all of our presenters and make a couple of quick points. One is that back to that cycle idea. Underneath all of this, and it feels like it needs to get said today because we've been so focused on innovation and development and wider use, is the fundamental research, the basic research. And uh, the funding for that largely still is federal government competitive programs. We've been very, very fortunate with the CDS and other appropriations dollars. But in the end, system-wide, a big part of what we're trying to do in the Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation Office is to build capacity to get those competitive grants coming in to do basic work uh, across the agencies that, that still do that kind of funding. So um, 
All of this rests on that, as well as everything else that you've heard today, capacity to grow the talent in ways that the state of Maine needs, capacity to tie into the national research picture, and then the capabilities through infrastructure to have the kinds of facilities that will allow these partnerships. It's really an exciting moment. And what we've been working at now for the last three years, four years, is to expand out what UMaine had been doing for quite a long time and to be sure that the entire system is engaged to the extent that that works and fits. So thank you for uh, your attention and we appreciate the chance to talk to you. Great, thank you. And we get the message. Basic research is the foundation. Got it. <laughs> thank you. Let's turn to money since we sort of ended the last conversation. Vice Chancellor for Finance and Administration and Treasurer, Ryan Lowe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, three items that I'll uh, cover uh, briefly this morning. I'll start with investment results. Uh, I'm going to shift over to a FY24 budget forecast and just a quick budget process reminder for uh, for everyone. Well, let me start with investment results. <clears throat> investment results um, uh, through February are included in your board materials. Uh, the managed investment pool with a February market value of $388 million, saw a gain of 2.6% for the month, brings the fiscal year to date gain to positive 8.5%. Um, in addition, uh, we are estimating a preliminary return of a positive 2.5% in March. The pension fund with a market value in February of 18 million uh, also saw a gain uh, for the month of February of 0.7%, bringing their fiscal year to date gain to 4.8% uh, estimated returns for March. Again, our positive 1.8%. Uh, and then finally, the operating fund uh, with a market value of 310 million, uh, a more conservative asset allocation, saw a gain of 0.5% or nearly 1.3 million for the month of February, bringing our fiscal year to date gain to 11.5 million. That is 9.5 million over our annual budget. We do estimate an additional return for the operating fund portfolio of about 1% for March. Um, so certainly, uh, certainly positive. Um, I always caution against the roller coaster uh, of these returns. They're, they're likely and often do change uh, even after I printed it. The Dow lost 900 points since I printed this piece of paper. Um, so just the caution that um, we don't count anything there until June 30th. Uh, let me move on to budget forecast if we're ready to. I do have a handout oh, for this one. Nice. Um, <laughs> if you can read that. Um, so as a reminder, thank you very much. Uh, as a reminder, we do a budget forecast uh, three times a year. Uh, typically uh, in October, although in more recent years, that's been replaced by uh, budget uh, supplemental budgets, kind of resetting the benchmark. Uh, and then we do one in G at the end of January, another one uh, at the end of March. Um, the, if uh, Just to use the example we have up in front of us, the budgeted column uh, that you see up there um, represents uh, the most recently approved uh, trustee budgets. Uh, so in some cases, uh, we we made changes uh, either in November or January. Um, that is what's reflected in that budget column. Uh, the forecast column is really our best estimate um, to date. Um, we try to be conservative um, here. If we haven't completely identified how to close a gap, we want to acknowledge that up front, uh, even though we may already be working uh, on solutions um, for that. Let me say overall, or let me just complete the rest of the sheet so you know what we're looking at. The budget variance column is just simply the difference between the budget and the forecast. We always love it when that is a positive number. Um, to the extent that there is a gap that needs to be closed, either originally closed or as part of the amended budget, um, you'll see that in the funding column. So uh, we'll use the University of Maine as an example since they're right at the top of the page. Uh, you can see originally a budgeted deficit a forecasted a budgeted deficit of 8.1. Um, the forecast uh, shows an improvement of about 90,000. Um, that still leaves that $8 million gap. Uh, they are closing that as they had originally proposed to close that uh, through a reserve transfer. I'll work my way down the list. Um, UMA uh, showing a slightly negative uh, budget adjustment, now forecasting a 
uh, a deficit of about 246,000. Uh, that is mostly, as is the case for a lot of these, mostly related to unanticipated um, expenses. I think in a lot of cases, and we've shown this in the past, we'll typically, we'll close these, a lot of these through expense reductions through the end of the year, just the natural churn of, uh, of spending, you'll find that you have savings. Um, tentatively now where we're sitting here, we'll, we're identifying that as a transfer from reserves. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, at UMF, uh, we are moving from what we had originally forecast as a, as a balanced budget, uh, now anticipating a deficit of 362,000 in this year. Um, had a lot of conversations, had three, at least three conversations with the chancellor, with the president, um, since uh, last week uh, when we completed um, this forecast. Um, I have a lot of confidence in, uh, in uh, President McDonald and his team um, at UMF. Uh, they have a number of ideas to close this gap. Uh, they had closed about a third of it um, yesterday um, as we were, were kind of, I was preparing uh, my notes. I thought about amending the document on the fly, but uh, rather just wanted to note um, that they've already closed um, some of that, we expect to close that uh, by the end of the year. Um, we'll do updates. Uh, Farmington will be the only one with a gap by the time I finish this presentation. Uh, we'll plan to give the committee updates again at, uh, at the FFT uh, meeting on the 7th and the board meeting uh, on May the 20th. Um, at Fort Kent, um, you see a positive trend there, originally forecasting a deficit of about 1.5 million, um, now showing something closer to 1.2 million. Um, that leaves, uh, that's a positive variance of 246,000. Um, you see uh, on the right uh, how that uh, gap is being closed. Um, 710,000 from campus reserves, and then 500,000 that the board committed as part of the 2024 budget. Um, at Presque Isle, uh, very positive uh, news there. Again, originally forecasting a deficit of about 214,000. Um, now actually forecasting uh, a surplus of 144,000. So not only is that a nice $360,000 swing, um, but over in the budget stabilization column, um, you see nothing there now. Uh, that was the board had previously approved um, $220,000 worth of transfers to Presque Isle. Uh, those are no, no longer necessary. So uh, big, uh, big congratulations to Presque Isle, to President Rice and Betsy and the team there. Um, at USM, um, you know, this is what we really want to see in a perfect world. Um, we're still tracking budget, uh, no changes, positive uh, or negative. Um, so I'm um, certainly pleased about those numbers. Um, same thing at Maine Law. Um, it looks a little different here. It looks like we're forecasting a, a budget deficit of 1.3 million. Uh, and technically we were, um, but you'll recall as part of the 24 budget process, um, uh, Maine Law had some capital spending in their budget. And we swapped that out for some bond funding that uh, Maine Law also had. Um, and so we'll transfer over 1.3 million uh, of those bond funds uh, as soon as they, ex you know, we have them expend it and then we reimburse them for that. So a uh, lot of numbers on that line, but really nothing to see. What I can say is that Maine law uh, is on budget uh, as we expected. If I drop below the campuses for just a second, you'll see three lines that we also forecast, uh, governance, university services, uh, and the employee benefit pool. Um, governance is, uh, is the chancellor's office. It's uh, it's myself. It's a handful of kind of the senior um, leadership team uh, at the system, uh, roughly 26 individuals, I think, in that pool. Um, we're uh, including the board offices in that governance piece as well. Um, collectively, we're now projecting we'll end the year about 450,000 um, to the positive there. Uh, in university services, which is what we typically think of as shared services, um, we are also forecasting a $450,000 surplus there. Um, that is great because we were originally forecasting um, a deficit um, that we were going to cover with some transfers, but uh, that's about a $900,000 swing there, so that's certainly positive. So collectively, um, what you see uh, from the campuses and from the system is about a $1.4 million improvement uh, from um, where we were uh, when we passed the various versions uh, of the campus and system budgets. So uh, I always love talking about numbers that don't have brackets around them. So that is certainly a positive. Finally, the last item that we forecast again is the unrestricted uh, investment income. Um, you see the same $9.5 million variance that I just referenced 
uh, in my notes uh, previously. Um, as a uh, for for our newer members, um, as I said, we'll get to the end of the year. We'll see what that number really is, um, and then we'll work with the chancellor and come back and make a recommendation. Um, you'll recall we've got a we've got a modest shortfall in the repaving Main Street funding, um, and we'll make hopefully that'll be a positive number, and we'll make recommendations for transferring um, some into various reserve accounts and funding other key um, initiatives. And then finally, Madam Chair, my last item uh, was just a, a budget process reminder. So again, thank you to all the campuses, all of the uh, faculty, staff um, that participated in the in the in that budget development for the FY25 process. Thought we had a really productive uh, FFT meeting. Uh, on March the 20th. And as a reminder, uh, we will be back again, the FFT committee meeting next Wednesday uh, to review uh, a number of items, uh, questions that came up from committee members um, on the March 20th meeting. Uh, we'll go into detail about the system uh, governance budget. Uh, we'll go into detail about the shared service budget, and then we'll cover a number of other topics that the committee asked about. That completes my report and happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Questions? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was fast. We're now moving into our action items. And um, for those listening at home, to coin your phrase, um, this reflects work done by committees over a number of months. All of these issues have been reviewed, discussed, reviewed again, and discussed again. So while we work quickly through these um, resolutions, it's because it's a result of a, a considerable committee work. So let us begin with tab nine the sale of an 85-acre uh, parcel of land, and President Hadeen will set that up for us, or not. Harmony, Maine, Harmony, which one is it? I'm sorry, no, I don't know you're on my list. doing something here today. Um, so it's the, it's the Harmony, Maine land Yes, sale? yes, that we have a piece of land that we are proposing to sell. In Harmony, Maine. <laughs> well done. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the proposed, the proposed resolution that the Board of Trustees accepts the recommendation of the Finance Facility and Technology Committee and authorizes the University of Maine system acting through the University of Maine at Fort Kent to sell an approximately 85-acre parcel of land located on Map 2, Lot 7 in Harmony, Maine. All final terms and conditions of the sale agreement a subject to review and approval of the University of Maine System Treasurer and General Counsel. Do I have a motion? Moved by Trustee Kane, sec seconded by Trustee Trustee Misha. Any any questions or concerns? Pleased to see revenue generating activities. All those in favor? Trustee Martin. I approve. All those opposed? The motion passes. We'll move to tab ten. The University of Maine Board of Agriculture appointment confirmation. President Farini Mundy for for Donald Mar Marion. Uh, Donald, yes. uh, we promote uh, propose his confirmation as our, our board of agriculture. <laughs> yes, very qualified and um, highly regarded across the state of Maine. Great. Okay, that uh, Pat, uh, are you are you moving it or are you talking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just want, I just want to make a comment about Don Marine. I served with him for several years and just knew him to be an outstanding man. And just wanted to say that, you know, haven't seen Don in five years. I hope he's listening. I just wanted to say something nice about him. I agree. It's well said. <laughs> great, great. Right. Trustee Cates. I, I just, Pat beat me to it, but I also wanted to give a shout out to Don Marine, who is one of the finest human beings I've ever known. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. I guess we know what he did in his past life. Um, that the Board of Trustees approves the following research faculty reappointment to the UMaine Board of Agriculture, Dr. Donald Marin, for a five-year term, effective April 8, 2024. Can I have a motion? Rep Trustee Flood, seconded by Trustee Kane. All those in favor? All those opposed? Oh, and Kelly? I approve. Great. Motion passes. Tab 11. And I'm not turning to the president. So they can answer questions. I've learned my lesson, unless there's something you want to say. I'm sorry. Who? Okay. Okay. All right. Tab 11, the UMaine Advanced Manufacturing Center. 
we've got six six projects coming up uh, quickly. As the chair notes, they've been thoroughly discussed in lots of places. Uh, so the first of these is a request to the board uh, authorization to allocate up to 4.5 million for renovations within the existing space of the Advanced Manufacturing Center known as AMC uh, for two purposes. One will be for the main College of Engineering and Computing Student Success Center and the other for the Industry 4.0 Manufacturing Training Innovation Center. Great. We can answer questions as needed. Okay. Any questions? Saying, saying, wait, saying, uh, I'll read the text that the Board of Trustees accepts the recommendation of the FFT and authorizes the University of Maine system acting for the University of Maine to expend up to $4.5 million for renovations with the AMC for the creation of the MCEC Student Success Center and the 4.0 Industry Manufacturing Training and Innovation Center. Moved by Trustee Kane, seconded by Trustee Eames. Any comment, questions? All those in favor? All all those opposed? Trustee Martin? I approve. Thank you. Tab 12, we'll just keep cranking through these, Joan. Yep. Tab so, uh, thank you. This is a request uh, for an increase in the authorization for the Green Engineering and Materials, or GEM, Factory of the Future, um, by up to $66 million in external funds, so that the new total comes to $81.3 million. Uh, we can go into detail as needed, but this is to build out the extension to the south of the ASCC to enable us to bring together um, student-related uh, work in MCEC as well as uh, world-class research activity at ASCC. Any questions? Seeing none, that the Board of Trustees accepts, am I reading what the, accepts the um, Recommendation of the FFT and authorizes the University of Maine system acting for the University of Maine to expend up to an additional 66 million for a total of 81.3 million for the construction of the Green Engineering and Materials Factory of the Future. Moved by Trustee Kate, seconded by Trustee Misho. All those in favor? Trustee Martin? I accept. All those opposed? Motion passes. Tab 13, University of Maine Electrical Infrastructure Upgrade. Right. This is the um, University of Maine, wait a minute, University of Maine um, Energy Center, UMEC. And what we seek here is authorization to invest up to 25 million in crucial electrical infrastructure upgrade and renewal. Uh, this is necessary both for our current system, which our um, VP FA frequently says is near end of productive life. Mm -hmm. Here it says beyond useful life. Uh, and the uh, capital constructions coming uh, that we've already mentioned and that are coming up, GEM um, and others are going to be dependent upon this kind of capability. Great, any questions? Seeing none, that the Board of Trustees accepts the recommendation of the FFT and authorizes the University of Maine system acting through the University of Maine to expand up to 25 million for crucial upgrades and renewal of the university's electrical infrastructure. Moved by Trustee Kane, seconded by Trustee Eames. All those in favor? All those opposed? Kelly, uh, Trustee- I'm Martin. also in favor. Thank you. Uh, tab 14, soccer. Okay, University of Maine requests authorization to spend up to 27.3 million for the construction of a new soccer complex, new track and field complex, new parking lot to be located north of the Alphonse Stadium, new roadway uh, connecting the complexes listed above, as well as the field hockey complex and infrastructure to support existing athletic facilities as part of the UMS Transforms project. Great, any questions? Seeing none, that the Board of Trustees accepts the recommendation of the FFT and authorizes the University of Maine system acting through the University of Maine to expand up to 27.3 million for the design and construction of the soccer complex, track and field complex, parking lots, roadway to be named Alfond Way and needed infrastructure as part of the UMS Transforms project and included in the athletics 10 year master plan. Moved by Trustee Kane, seconded by Trustee Eames. Comments, questions? Alfond Way seems highly appropriate. Um, all those in favor? Trustee Martin, all those opposed? The motion passes. Next is tab 15, uh, upgrades to Hitchner Hall. Right, this is a request for authorization for expenditures for up to uh, 8.5 million for stewardship and deferred maintenance in um, a variety of places, HVAC systems and controls upgrades, 
uh, the replacement of obsolete building HVAC systems within Hitchner Hall, the 87 wing, and the Bennett Hall lecture wing. Okay. Any questions? Seeing none, that the Board of Trustees accepts the recommendation of the Finance Facilities and Technology Committee and authorizes the University of Maine system acting for the University of Maine to expend up to $8.5 million for the replacement and upgrade of obsolete building HVAC systems within Hitchner Hall, 87 wing, and Bennett Hall lecture wing. Moved by... Trustee Kane, seconded by Trustee Eames. All those in favor? I'm also in favor. Thank you. All those opposed? Motion passes. Trustee, we just heard about the importance of single room bathrooms, so Hancock Hall. <laughs> yes, uh, we seek authorization to allocate up to $1.5 million for the renovation of existing space to create single user bathrooms within um, Hancock Hall. Questions? The resolution is that the Board of Trustees accepts the recommendation of the FFT Committee and authorizes the University of Maine system acting for the University of Maine to spend up to $1.5 million to make renovations within Hancock Hall for the creating of single-use bathrooms for students that seek upgraded residential hall amenities not currently available within the two existing buildings. Moved by Trustee Kane, seconded by Trustee Eames. All those in favor? I'm also in favor. Thank you. All those opposed? Motion passes. That ends our action agenda. We have um, a consent agenda to do, and we have the chancellor on free from his accreditation visit. Um, oh, well, so. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> uh, there he is. Hello, welcome back. Um, for any comments he wants to make before, then we'll do the consent agenda and break for lunch. Yeah, quickly, uh, obviously, uh, had explained, um, and I and and you explained as well earlier in the meeting that I needed to be in Portland uh, to meet with the American Bar Association concerning uh, the, their committee concerning uh, our accreditation. So I apologize for not being able to be with you uh, today, although I was with you um, yesterday. Um, again, I, I just want to point out that uh, the actions you just took on a number of uh, capital expenditure opportunities um, is uh, executing, quite frankly, our strategic plan. We understood and, and recognized that we had a deficit uh, in infrastructure um, because of underinvestment over a 40 to 50 year period of time. Um, we are now going to the market and explaining that we are making the kinds of investments um, uh, that will improve uh, our universities and quite frankly, make them more attractive to both in-state and out-of-state students. Uh, tremendous amount of work uh, at each of uh, the campuses that were universities that were represented today, but there's more to come. Uh, and these are important investments um, as we uh, 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 seek to uh, uh, attract that audience of people to join us uh, as students to get their baccalaureates, their master's and their doctoral degrees uh, here in the state of Maine. And quite frankly, hopefully stay in the state of Maine and drive the workforce and drive the economic development necessary uh, for our success. Um, I also want to thank uh, the presidents again, uh, as I frequently do, we have a tremendous team of presidents who are working together and vice chancellors who are working together uh, to move things at a pace uh, not uh, heretofore seen uh, within the system. And it would not be possible without the cooperation of the trustees as well. We're very grateful for the actions taken today uh, and um, quite frankly, congratulate everyone uh, for making those investments as uh, uh, we turn uh, around our uh, demographic challenges. I also uh, want to remind everyone that we are well ahead of our um, uh, total matriculation numbers for the year. Uh, obviously, that won't, we won't know our final numbers until we actually have the census done um, uh, in the fall semester. Uh, but I'd rather be running ahead than running behind as we were last year. Uh, and again, I want to give credit to the presidents and to the uh, individuals at each of the universities working on attracting uh, uh, students and quite frankly, uh, helping them to make a commitment to, uh, to us. I also want to thank um, our admissions uh, folks and particularly the leadership of the University of Maine in helping us address what was a, a very 
and has and continues to be a very difficult problem for us to work through with the FASA uh, a problem that's playing out across the country. Uh, we came up with a, a, a solution or a workaround. I'm very proud of that. I think that has uh, led to uh, uh, more commitments being made to us uh, this year than, than perhaps in the past and our ability to respond to this emergency for many families, not uh, trying to make a decision on where to send uh, their child or that child uh, trying to make a decision where to go without the FAFSA form has been difficult, uh, but we have worked with families across Maine and across uh, uh, the rest of New England, where most of our students come from. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, again, this team has just done um, an unbelievable job. And I particularly want to, to point out um, uh, the extra uh, lending of the resources of the University of Maine to the other universities uh, to accomplish this. Uh, that's my report for today. I know you guys uh, have, have a few other things to get done. Um, very much appreciate um, uh, all of our interaction. Thank you. And I hope the site visit's going well. Any questions for the yes. chancellor? <laughs> May the ABA bless us again. <laughs> <laughs> Consent agenda. Yes, ma'am. I think it that I stand between you and the eclipse. I'm not sure. <laughs> so I will move for the Board of Trustees to approve the consent agenda item, acceptance of the minutes. May I have a second? Uh, second. Trustee Cates is second. All those in favor? I'm also in favor. Kelly? Any opposed? Motion's carried. My one job, and I apparently have failed miserably here. Okay. <laughs> I know. We're at that time. Uh, <laughs> I'm so excited it's for the eclipse. Slate. You can ask them to put the slate in. Okay. Then I will move uh, for the slate, which would be tab 17, tab 18, tab 19, and tab 20 to approve this consent agenda and the acceptance of the minutes. Can I have a second? Uh, seconded by <laughs> Trustee Kane. All those in favor? Yay. Are there any opposed? All right, the motion has carried. Excellent. <laughs> and I wanna welcome Tristan officially as our student rep. Nice to have you. Well, wonder of wonder, miracles, miracles, we finished early. Um, and we did get through a great deal of business, important stuff, great reports. Thank you all very, very much. Um, our next meeting, we will be up north in Fort Kent. <laughs> and we're, we're looking forward to the drive. It'll be beautiful. And there won't be any black flies yet, right? Good. Excellent. Excellent. But that's um, May 19th and 20th. We'll be there. And I want to thank everybody. Um, for being here for a good meeting and go forth and enjoy the eclipse. There are box lunches that you may choose to eat here or take with you. Um, and unless there's any other information for the good of the university system, we are adjourned. <laughs>